ان ما زالت الحرب دائره في الهارت فيلير ما عندناش نصر واضح في الهارت فيلير ما زالت انباء المعارك تتوالى ما هياش من السبجكتس العلماء حققوا فيها نصر واضح لو احنا عندنا شويه داتا وشويه سرفايفل بينيفيت في بعض الميديكيشنز وبعض الانسترومنتيشن في الهارت فيلير وريديوسد ايجكشن فراكشن لكن ما زلنا توبك زي الهارت فيلير بريزيرفد ايجكشن فراكشن مش عارفين نعمل فيها ايه فالنهارده الحقيقه نامل ان احنا نضيف بعض المعلومات لينا نامل ان يكون في ديسكشن من حضراتكم النهارده عندنا ضيوف اجانب عايز احيي الدكتور مجدي دكتور مجدي عمل مجهود كبير قوي عشان اليوم ده هو يطلع بالصوره ده هي معانا ضيوف اجانب الحقيقه يعني بحيي الدكتور مجدي من قلبي بهنيه على حاجات كتير جدا من اهمها يعني الحقيقه تمثيله مشرف جدا في جمعيه القلب المصريه دكتور مجدي والدكتور عزه حققوا اصوات عاليه جدا ده فخر كبير جدا لاسم القلب احنا ممتنين لدوره في جمعيه القلب وازاي بيعمل سبورت للاسم عندنا مش عايز اطول على حضراتكم احنا هندي الميكروفون للدكتور مجدي عشان يبدا المحاضره الاولى بتاعته وانا لسه بقول له المحاضره بتاعتك يعني شكلها اهم من المحاضرات الاجانب كلنا مستنيين هنتبدا عايز بس كمان احيي الدكتور احمد كمال الدكتور احمد هو اللي ساهم في التنظيم هو اللي عمل كل حاجه البرنامج العلمي والمكان وكده هو دكتور احمد هو الجندي مش مجهول هو الجندي المعلوم بالنسبه لنا كلنا بحييك وبهنيك وانا معتمد على الشباب دول ان هم يقيموا كل حاجه الحقيقه شكرا جزيلا والى الاخ العزيز الاستاذ الدكتور مجدي عبد الحميد دكتور مجدي صباح الخير على حضراتكم جميعا طبعا يعني مش عارف اشكر اخي وصديقي العزيز استاذ الدكتور محمد عبد الغني طبعا ازاي يعني الحقيقه الفتره فتره وجود استاذ الدكتور محمد عبد الغني يعني مش قادرين نلاحق بقينا بننهج من كتر النشاط العلمي المتميز الحقيقه يوميا اسبوعيا سواء فيزيكال او زوم ميتنجز فبشكره طبعا على السبورت الكبير اللي بيديه لكل الحقيقه الاستاف اللي في الاسم فيعني حاجه مشرفه واتشيفمنتس يعني هايلي ابريشيتد في الفتره كلها ان شاء الله. انا شايف الورق قاعدين في في سبيس وكان ما فيش بريكوشنز يعني عشان حتى المدرج يبقى مليان. <تصفيق> انتشروا انتشروا انتشروا. أه بشكر طبعا على حضراتكم جميعا طبعا استاذ الدكتور ياسر الشرف، استاذ الدكتور محمد الرملي، استاذ الدكتور سامي محكوم، استاذ الدكتور كريم سعيد، استاذ الدكتور وليد عمار. بشكر حضرتك دكتور محمد بيه لحضور حضرتك، استاذ الدكتور ناجي طبعا وكل الحضور مش عايز انسى حد وفي انتظار كل الزملاء يشرفونا طبعا. بشكر طبعا دكتور محمد على التهنئه بتاعه مجلس اداره جمعيه القلب المصريه وطبعا هو النجاح نجاح للاسم يعني احنا مجرد اي شخص يمثل الاسم فده بيبقى النجاح في الاخر لاسم القلب وليس نجاح الاشخاص فشكرا يا دكتور محمد على الدعم وكل طبعا اعضاء الاسم اللي شاركوا في الانتخابات وكان لهم دور كبير جدا في نجاح الزملاء يعني بشكر طبعا شركه نوبارتس على سبونسرنج اليوم النهارده Uh, without بقى delay, يعني, uh, I will start in a couple of minutes to cover uh, the uh, 10 commandments of Heart Failure Guidelines 2021. Uh, what's new? Uh, we know that uh, heart failure is uh, a progressive disease uh, which is associated with increased mortality and uh, recurrent hospitalization. And the journey of heart failure for uh, starting from no heart failure to heart failure if 
patients having risk factors for heart failure, like coronary artery disease, which is the most common cause for heart failure. And then after diagnosis and treatment and the initiation of guidelines, the right medical therapy, uh, acutely compensated heart failure and worsening of heart failure is common in those patients due to several reasons. And in spite of the use of the new drugs devices, still the mortality is high, 50% mortality from five years from diagnosis until the end stage, which is the advanced heart failure uh, patients who should be referred for advanced heart failure therapy for consideration of uh, mechanical circuitry support devices, LVAD, or the need for uh, transplantation. So what are the new drugs which uh, changed the recent guidelines? Uh, SGL2 inhibitors, uh, we know that uh, all filtered glucose is reabsorbed in the proximal tubules through the sodium glucose co-transporter 2. 90% of the glucose is reabsorbed at this site, 10% through SGLT1. So drugs like dabagliflozin or imbagliflozin, which block the reabsorption of glucose at SGL2, this will be associated with uh, glycosuria, loss of calories, as well as uh, uh, mild reduction in blood pressure. And we have the evidence from two landmark clinical trials, WHF trial for dabagliflozin and the impero reduced trial for imbagliflozin. In WHF trial, which included more than 4,800 patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction, EF less than 40% function class 2 to 4, where they randomized to receive DABA 10 milligram compared with placebo, looking for the primary endpoint, which was the composite of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. This was associated with uh, a significant reduction in the primary endpoint, and the number needed to treat was 21 patients after a median follow-up of uh, one and a half year. The same was uh, confirmed in Impero reduced trial uh, for the same patients on 3,700 patients, and the impact of closing 10 milligram also was associated with significant reduction in the primary endpoint, in addition to uh, prevention of the decline in renal function. So a renal protective effect as well was proved with the use of uh, SGL2 inhibitors. And interestingly, these results were the same in patients who have diabetes as well as non-diabetic patients. So what are the mechanisms which might explain the benefit of SGL2 inhibitors in heart failure? Actually, many mechanisms have been described. If you look for uh, reduction of renin angiotensin aldosterone system, sympathetic nervous system, decreased oxidative stress, decreased inflammation, and all these uh, mechanisms contribute to, to decrease cardiac preload, the decreased remodeling ventricular as well as atrial, uh, improved systolic function, decreased diastolic abnormalities, decreased fibrosis, uh, increased and the improvement of endothelial function, decreased vascular stiffness, uh, and uh, the renal protective effect is due to increased natriuresis, increased tubular glomerular feedback, uh, decreased alpominuria as uh, reported uh, in DABA CKD, for example, decreased fluid retention, decreased uric acid body mass ketones, increased ketones, so liability for diabetic ketoacidosis in type 1 diabetes, also it is considered an absolute contraindication to be given for type 1 diabetes. So uh, the other drug uh, also, which will be discussed uh, in more details by uh, my friend, Professor Walid Ammar, in the new drugs uh, later on, which is uh, Verisiguat. Verisiguat is a unique and novel drug which acts by a different mechanism. We know that in heart failure patients, due to increased oxidative stress, as well as the inflammation and the endothelial dysfunction, there is deficiency of the nitric oxide synthase pathway and decreased nitric oxide. So when nitric oxide decreases, this will decrease the activity of soluble guanine cyclase, which will decrease at the end the availability of cyclic guanine monophosphate. So if we give a drug which is the cyclic guanine monophosphate agonist, like uh, Verisiguat, this will decrease the bad effects due to a reduction of uh, nitric oxide. So at the, end, at the end, 
at the level of the heart, there is a decreased remodeling, decreased stiffness fibrosis, uh, and uh, uh, reverse remodeling effect, vasodilator effect, as well as uh, increased renal blood flow and decreased sodium and fluid retention. And this is what was proved in a study which was known as uh, a Victoria trial, compared with the standard of care that the use of Verisiguat was associated with statistically significant reduction in the primary endpoint cardiovascular death or first heart failure hospitalization and the absolute risk reduction 4.2% number needed to treat was 24. So what about the new guidelines? What's new in these guidelines? We know that this inhibitor beta blocker MRA are considered class one A recommendation based on many studies which prove the efficacy of these group of drugs in reducing mortality as well as heart failure hospitalization. So the new that dabagliflozin and the imbagliflozin are recommended for patients with HFREF to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and mortality. Sacobitril valsartan is recommended as a replacement for ACE inhibitor in patients with HFREF to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and death. And this is class 1B recommendation. Arni may be considered a first line therapy instead of ACE inhibitor, but this is class 2B recommendation, 2B recommendation in newly diagnosed heart failure patients. Diuretics uh, are well-known uh, drugs which relieve symptoms and signs of congestion without impact on mortality. It decreases hospitalization as well. It's class 1T recommendation. Angiotensin receptor blocker in patients who are intolerant to ACE inhibitor or ARNI is considered class 1B recommendation. So now we have the four pillars which should be started earlier for patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Renin angiotensin system inhibitor, ACE inhibitor, uh, or ARNI, beta blocker, MRA, and the new game player, which is uh, SGL2 inhibitor, loop diuretics uh, to relieve uh, congestion. What about uh, device therapy in patients who have uh, electrical and or mechanical dysynchrony, which can be uh, diagnosed based on the YQRS complex? So in patients who have left bundle branch block morphology and QRS duration more than 150 milliseconds, this is considered a class 1A recommendation to consider CRT with ejection fraction less than 35% despite optimal medical treatment in order to improve symptoms and reduce morbidity and mortality. If also left bundle branch block morphology but the QRS is 130 to 149 milliseconds, this is considered a class 1B recommendation. And in patients with non-left bundle branch block morphology, QRS more than 150 milliseconds, this is considered class 2A recommendation. 130 to 149 millisecond QRS is considered class 2B recommendation. We have also to consider the recommendations for implanting uh, ICD, which is considered class 1A recommendation as secondary prevention. And in primary prevention, ICD is class 1A for ischemic etiology and non-ischemic heart failure is considered class 2A recommendation. So the new in the guidelines is downgrading ICD in primary prevention to 2A, not 1A like uh, previous recommendations. So this uh, diagnosis, this uh, therapeutic algorithm for uh, HFREF patients that all patients should be given is ARNI or ARNI, beta blocker MRA, DABA or EMBA, loop diuretics. And then according to the Indications for device therapy, CRT, if the QRS is more than 130 milliseconds, uh, ICD primary or secondary prevention. Uh, if patients are not responding to medical treatment, we have second line drugs, uh, which is uh, considered a class two recommendation. So evapradine, which is an IF current inhibitor, act specific on the SCE node to decrease SCE node activity slowing the heart rate when patients having heart rate more than 70 beats per minute, in spite of receiving the guideline recommended maximum or tolerated dose of beta blocker. So uh, evapradine is considered a class 2A recommendation and based on the SHIFT trial, which proved the efficacy of uh, evapradine in reducing the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, driven mainly by reduction in heart failure hospitalization. Patients who are contraindicated to receive beta blocker are considered also a class 2A recommendation to receive uh, evapradine. 
very sick what uh, it now is considered for patients who have worsening heart failure. So it's class 2B recommendation in addition to uh, ACE or RNA, beta blocker, MRA to reduce uh, mortality or heart failure hospitalization. The combination of hydralazine and isobiodinitrate should be considered in uh, Black American patients based on these studies. When ejection fraction less than 35% or EF less than 45 uh, combined with the uh, dilated ventricle in EHA class 3 to 4 uh, in patients despite the treatment with the ACE or RNA beta blocker MRA, or in patients who cannot uh, tolerate uh, ACE inhibitor or ARP or RNA, this is considered a class 2B recommendation. So again, a uh, very interesting algorithm which is summarize the different therapeutic strategies, uh, pharmacological and non-pharmacological, that to reduce mortality and hospitalization, uh, ACE, RNA, beta blocker, MRA, SG2 inhibitors, diuretics to relieve congestion, which is class 1C, uh, patients having QRS more than 150, consider CRT, and uh, ischemic etiology, ICD class 1A, uh, 130 to 149, it's class two, and the HFAP relation should be managed with rate control and anticoagulation. Digoxin can be used as a rate control, uh, revascularization uh, uh, by uh, using bypass surgery or PCI. IR deficiency should be treated with ferric carboxymal dose, significant aortic stenosis surgery or TAVI, percutaneous uh, mitral uh, edge to edge repair for secondary or functional mitral regurgitation, according to the data of COAPT trial, and evapradine for heart rate more than 70 beats per minute, hydralazine isorbidanitrate when indicated ARP for intolerant patients to ACE or RNA, uh, advanced heart failure therapy, which includes uh, MCS or uh, transplantation and the exercise rehabilitation multidisciplinary team approach for management of heart failure, is highly recommended. So what about uh, the other phenotype, which is the heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, EF 40 to 49%. Unfortunately, we didn't have uh, long-term trials for uh, this new phenotype. So the new guidelines recommended class 2B recommendation for ACE, ARP, beta blocker, MRA, psychometrial, valsartan, and the same for diuretics to relieve congestion. Also, the new guidelines uh, recommended that uh, patients uh, before hospital uh, discharge uh, should be uh, uh, evaluated to exclude persistent uh, signs of congestion before discharge and to optimize medical treatment in order to reduce uh, mortality and earlier uh, rehospitalization. And this is class 1C recommendation. And uh, evidence based uh, uh, oral medical treatment should be given before the discharge. So we encourage the use of uh, RNA as GL2 inhibitors, beta blockers, if uh, uh, the clinical status allow for the early use of beta blocker before hospital discharge. Then we have to uh, plan for earlier follow up within one to two weeks after the discharge to assess for congestion, drug tolerance. Uh, up titration of the drugs. Uh, and uh, the new guidelines also recommended screening for uh, iron deficiency in all patients with heart failure and uh, considering to give ferric carboxymal tools, which is class 2A, when patients have iron deficiency based on serum ferritin less than 100 nanogram per milli or ferritin 100 to 299 nanogram per milli with TSAT transferrin saturation less than 20% to improve symptoms and reduce hospitalization. So the 10 commands, commandments for the EC heart failure guidelines 2021, AC inhibitor or RNA, beta blocker, MRA, SGL2 inhibitors are the corner stool for heart failure therapy, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. CRT in selected patients with ejection fraction less than 35%, sinusrhythm, and QRS duration more than 130 milliseconds. ICD in patients with EF less than 35% when appropriate, primary prevention and secondary prevention. Heart transplantation or MCS in selected patients with advanced heart failure. Patients with will pre who are presenting with acute heart failure. And this is a nice topic which will be discussed by Dr. Ahmed Samir in the next session. 
that diuretics uh, are mandatory to relieve congestion, inotropes uh, when patients having uh, hypoperfusion, uh, vasopressors, patients who are not responding to inotropes, uh, uh, vasodilators when blood pressure above uh, 110 millimeter mercury, short-term uh, mechanical circulatory support uh, when indicated renal replacement therapy uh, based on the indications. Breeze charge and early follow-up within one to two weeks is important to assess for drug tolerance and up titration of drugs. Ferric carboxymal 2 is, is considered a class 2A recommendation in patients with iron deficiency. Patients with atrial fibrillation, which is responsible for worsening heart failure, either paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation, we have to consider pulmonary vein ablation for rhythmic control. Percutaneous edge to edge mitral valve repair in isolated secondary mitral regurgitation according to COAP trial. And when you have a diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis uh, uh, in patients presenting with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, having criteria suggestive of cardiac amyloidosis, screening for cardiac amyloidosis uh, by using uh, imaging modalities, technician pyrophosphate, CMR, and to consider the use of the new drug, which is tafamidis in improving the outcome for patients with cardiac amyloidosis. Thank you for your attention. Magdi, I thank you for the beautiful the guidelines, short points. وقلت لنا كمان الاب تو ديت مانجمنت عيان عنده اكيوت هارت فيلير او كرونيك هارت فيلير هي في اسئله كتير بس انا عشان الوقت هسال سؤال واحد ليه الجايد لاينز لسه ما زالت مصره انها تكتب ان الانجيوتينسين كونفيرتنج انزيم انهبيتور هو الفيرست لاين وحطها كلاس 1 اي وحطها في اول سطر وفي الاخر بيتكلم ان الساكوبيتريل فالزرتين ممكن يتاخد وممكن يبقى خلاص ما هالبرادايم كانت واضحه ليه ليه ما زال في اصرار ان احنا نحطه في الاول يعني ليه مش العكس؟ انا بسالك وانا عارف ان انت من الناس اللي بيكتبوا الجايد لاينز ف Very interesting question, uh, Professor Muhammad Taban. Uh, we know for many years, uh, many trials for the use of ACE inhibitors. Uh, although we have a positive outcome in favor for psychopathy valsart and compared with ACE inhibitor, but it's only a major, one large trial, randomized trial. So uh, according to the data of ACE and data of uh, Psychopatrial valsartan, this is class 1b, this is class 1a. So class 1a should come first. Then second important point is the cost issue and reimbursement. This is, uh, you know that in Germany, for example, the use of psychopatrial valsartan is only 45%, Germany, 45%. And it's much lower in other countries. So uh, the cost issue is very important. So the guidelines are very clear. For patients having heart failure, you should start with ACE inhibitor. If patients still symptomatic, despite the use of ACE inhibitor, should be replaced with RNA. If you have the facility, uh, uh, patients can afford the use of sacrobitary valsartan, of course, this will be more beneficial for patients. Uh, in my practice, I'm using uh, uh, natriuretic peptides, nt B. Patients who have high levels of nt B are more sick patients. So they will get more and more benefit from using psychopathy valsartan. If I have patients uh, function class two with near normal nt B levels and use an ACE inhibitor, I will not replace ACE inhibitor with psychopathy valsartan. So it depends according to clinical condition, availability of uh, psychopathy valsartan. So you can decide which one to be used. But the guidelines are clear. Plus 1A, plus 1B, 2B for newly diagnosed heart failure. Interest two, 
to be for newly diagnosed sarcoma? Actually, you did answer my question. Uh, in the presence of more sick patients, you start with sacrobitrial valzartan. Yeah. Uh, yes. In the absence of uh, financial periods. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about uh, the four pillars uh, of uh, anti-failure medications? Uh, sequence uh, of uh, administration of these agents, uh, beta blockers, sacrobitrial yeah. valzartan, uh, mineral receptor antagonist, uh, uh, actually, this How? is the title of the presentation of uh, Professor uh, Giuseppe Rosano, but I don't know uh, if he could uh, join us today or not. Uh, if he didn't join us for his presentation, which is patient profiling for tailoring medical therapy in HEFREF patients. So uh, I will present this uh, topic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Magdi. Uh, American guidelines and consensus document for do you have the American or American or European? American yeah. first choice, second three, but oh. not a senator. The reimbursement is, uh, is not a problem in, <laughs> in American. So they are starting with, with, uh, with the second. Yes, but Vata. European countries still, this is the uh, practice. Sorry, sorry. SGLT2 inhibitors in non diabetics. Hal Tosa Nefs those beta non diabetics? Exactly. Yeah, must in the impact of frozen. Yes, exactly. 10, 10 milligram diabetic or non diabetic? Yeah, recommendations lower dose for heart. No, the same dose 10 milligram diabetic or non diabetic. With those are 25, must be. No, 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 it's fixed dose 10 milligrams. Yes. You don't upload. 25. 10 milligram. 10 milligram. It's not uh, titration, no titration. Turkarim. Turkarim, I guess that's what's up. Shokan Dr. Magdi, on the presentation, very nice. I'll ask you a question, Dr. Mohammed, and I'll ask you a question about the choice of the RAS blocker versus the army, class 1A and class 1B. We have evidence for mortality benefit yeah. in favor of the uh, army versus the other rasp blocker. Hal da makan shi good rational in the army taakhud the upper place makan the ACI or the ARPS. Bizzat in the guidelines the European nafsiha liha similar scenario la maqarnet fi dat. Masalan kulbido grill versus the tika grill or the brazo grill based on one trial added good recommendations in favor of agent versus other. برضه بيزد على مورتاليتي بينيفيت مثلا في البليتو فهل ده ما كانش كونسيدرد؟ ان اديشن عندنا ايفيدنس ان المورتاليتي ديفرنس بيبقى فيري ايرلي وي شود نوت ويت على ان تي بي برو ام بي او كلينيكال بروجريس فيري امبورتنت بوينت طبعا دكتور كريم بس وي هاف اولسو دو ريمبر ذات اس ان هيبيتور اولسو ديكريس مورتاليتي of course, uh, when you compare uh, RNA with the uh, ACE inhibitor in uh, paradigm, there were more mortality reduction with the use of RNA. But both are considered class one drug. So we are considering the, the availability, the, 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 the issue of the cost and reimbursement. So uh, you can use both. So uh, I told you about my practice. Yeah. I can start with ACE in more compensated patients and in more sick patients, uh, I'm using ARNI. Uh, and the iron deficiency does not mean anemia. We may have yes, iron deficiency without anemia. In absence of iron ferroximal tools that's recommended, we have just oral medications or other IV uh, iron molecules. How would you recommend to manage iron deficiency in Egypt? Yes. Taban, this is very important for Walid. I don't know, I don't know the availability of ferric or proximal tools in the company V4D. No, we are using this iron sacrose. Dr. Ahmed Kamel did his message on the iron sacrose. If you want it, it's available, but it's not available. 
اه هو كل الايفكت بتاعه على السيمتومز يعني مش حاجه دراماتيك بتفرق بالنسبه لل لا بس ثور ياسر لا يعني البارنتر ايرن في الكربوكسيمال توز بالذات اكوردنج للستاتس بتاعته وريسنتلي في الافيرم اي اتش اف ترايل في الاكيوت حرفيا بيقلل السيمتومز بيحسن كواليتي اوف لايف بيقلل الهوسبيتاليزيشن في بعض الميتا اناليزيز بتقول بتقول انه بيقلل مورتاليتي واحنا الحقيقه وي ار يوزنج الانترا فينس هنا السكروز ويمكن في الدور الرابع انا ببعت على طول عاينين كتير جدا واحمد كمال بيشوفهم لان كان رسالته على البرنتر اير وبيحسب الدوز بالجانسوني ايكويشن ايكويشن بادي ويت وهيموجلوبين وبيدي الدوز اللي هي 100 ملي جرام افري اذر داي انتل وي اتشيف ماكسيمم كوركشن للايرن ستيتس ويتش يوجوالي تيك 3 ويكس اور اور مور and the very beneficial for patients very very يعني بيفرق جدا في الكواليتي اوف لايف والسيمبتومز ديفينتلي انما الاورال از نوت افكت اورال نو افكت ات اول يا اني كويستشن اي دونت نو اف بروفيسور روزانو اور بروفيسور يا موجود بروفيسور بيتر هو سامع حضرتك؟ I'm here. Professor Peter. Yes, yes, I'm here. You? Yes, I can hear you. Could you hear me? Could you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was following the session for almost half hour. Very interesting discussions. Thank you very much, Professor Severovich, for joining us today. Professor uh, Abdelghani, the chairman of cardiology department and all staff members at the cardiology department, Cairo University, are welcoming you in this uh, important heart failure day. So thank you very much for uh, accepting the invitation to be with us today. No, it's my pleasure. We had such a good cooperation that I'm always happy to be, to be with you and exchange uh, the knowledge and opinions about different subjects. Thank you very much for inviting me. We missed you in Cardio Egypt this year. We have. Yeah, that more. was. Uh, it is. It is not easy to to be at the all places you want to be. However, the next uh, the next year probably will be better. But as we all know, the the life is unpredictable, and uh, we should keep up with a strong <laughs> yes. uh, scientific yes. activity. That is very much important. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Peter Sivrovich is the professor of uh, internal medicine, uh, University of Belgrade, uh, Serbia. He is currently is the vice president of the European Society of Cardiology and is the immediate past president of the European Heart Failure Association. So, thank you very much, Professor Peter, and uh, uh, you will uh, give uh, your presentation is uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is a challenging topic from diagnosis to management. So the floor is yours, Professor Peter. Thank you very much, highly appreciated. So Magdi, as my good friend, gave me very important uh, and, and also very controversial topic. Uh, as you know, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has the increasing uh, incidence over the last uh, three decades. Um, it is also known that in many studies, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction was shown to have a high mortality and also the incidence of this disease within the frame of heart failure is extremely high. What makes the things uh, even more uh, complicated is that uh, heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction is associated with uh, multiple comorbidities and therefore it is not easy uh, to justify what's the most important etiological factor. In 2021, European guidelines for the management of the heart failure, uh, uh, HEPPEF was clearly defined as the entity with the symptoms and size and left ventricular ejection fraction more than 50%, but also with objective evidence of cardiac structural or functional abnormalities. So that seems uh, to be easy, but it's not at any way 
because in contrast uh, with the uh, left ventricular, uh, I mean heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction, the diagnosis of uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is uh, complex. In uh, 2016, we put uh, the special algorithm uh, called hfa pef for the diagnosis of, uh, of HEF-PEF, uh, starting with initial workup, uh, then going to the diagnostic workup, uh, and uh, uh, then if the diagnosis is not completely clear, we go to the advanced workup and etiolo etiological workup. So we, we spend uh, almost 25 months in putting this algorithm together. But at the end, it seems that it's very complex and needs uh, very much of understanding and equipment of the people who are doing uh, the diagnosis. This includes not only the diagnostic stress test, but also invasive hemodynamic measurement, then cardiovascular magnetic resonance and uh, uh, scintigraphy, CT and PET. So uh, to make the long story short, uh, we uh, may have the suspicion of have PET, but in most cases we need very thoughtful and long uh, workup to make this diagnosis. In the busy clinical work, sometimes is not easy. In 2019, we put forward some clinical practice update, uh, which is uh, still uh, very valid in terms of uh, giving the idea what pharmacotherapic uh, agents can be used in the patient uh, with uh, HEPF, and I'm gonna discuss them uh, in, in uh, a short uh, period of time, giving the, the short explanation about everybody, uh, everything. So beta blockers in heart failure uh, were seen in, uh, as one of the important uh, drug in treatment of uh, HFPF. Uh, the effect of beta blockers on all cause mortality uh, and cardiovascular mortality uh, was uh, not uh, really proved. Uh, the same uh, was true for ejection fraction uh, of uh, 40 to 49, getting close uh, in both uh, sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation. The same is true with uh, uh, renin-angiotensin aldosterone inhibitors. And uh, as we see from the charm preserved, PEP, CHF, eye preserve, and top cat we did not have any significant difference between the, uh, the drug which was uh, investigated and placebo. Uh, we may say the same thing with the mineral or corticoid uh, blockers uh, because no significant difference in, in cardiovascular mortality, sudden cardiac death or heart failure hospitalization was uh, shown in, uh, in any of the uh, mineral or uh, corticoid receptor blockers. However, since we did not have at that time any drug which can improve the, the longevity of our patient, but also the symptoms, uh, these drugs were partially uh, recommended for the treatment of heart failure. Sacubitil varsartan, was the next one, which uh, was a big hope in the treatment of uh, HEPF. Uh, and you can see the mega trial Paragon HF was conducted in uh, 840 sites in 43 countries, uh, coming up uh, with a non-significant 13% reduction of the total heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death. As you can see, the results were borderline. And uh, what is important uh, to underline is that only six uh, events were needed uh, to show the positive effect of sacubitril varsartan uh, on the reduction of heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death. However, in some groups, uh, meaning females and uh, left ventricular ejection fraction or at or below 57%, the effect of sacubitil valsartan in Paragon AGF uh, was uh, uh, shown, uh, leading uh, to the interesting uh, uh, 
reaction of the uh, Food and Drug Administration in the United States, in the United States, which gave the the approval for the sacubitril valsartan in the treatment of patients with heart failure, meaning with reduced ejection fraction, but also with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, so this is one of the first trial. Uh, which showed that the, the, the mega trial, uh, double blind, uh, high quality trials may be the past because they cost a long a lot and also they take a long time uh, to consider. And uh, taking all this in account in the 2021 guidelines presented the European Society of Cardiology meeting in August, uh, the recommendation for the treatment of um, HFPF were very uh, modest, uh, recommending diuretic in congested patient and also taking care of uh, etiologists and cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular comorbidities. However, a day later, uh, empagliflozin uh, in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction trial was uh, released. Um, and the emperor preserved uh, on almost 6,000 patients was one of the first trials ever, which gave us the historical uh, uh, right to have uh, something to treat the patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Empagliflozin, 10 milligrams one daily versus placebo once daily, show the excellent uh, primary composite endpoint of the cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization with excellent hazard ratio of uh, 0.79, a number needed to treat uh, 31. Uh, uh, cardiologists all over the world and heart failure specialists were really happy to have SGLT2 inhibitors as an excellent uh, treatment strat strategies in patient uh, with uh, HFPF. If we look in details, the com complements of primary uh, composite uh, endpoint, we can clearly see that the positive result was due for the first hospitalization of uh, heart failure and less uh, to the cardiovascular death. However, primary composite endpoint was largely positive with an excellent statistical significance, uh, giving us uh, the possibility to have completely new outlook on the treatment of the uh, HFPF. Uh, the safety of uh, empagliflozin uh, was excellent and uh, none of the significant uh, cardiovascular or non-cardiovascular effect uh, were revealed. Uh, going uh, further on, uh, we have a significant number of the patient with uh, HFPF uh, who may have trans amyloid cardiomyopathy and uh, tafamidis uh, uh, was shown to be effective in, in this case, uh, giving the all-cause mortality very much reduced in those patients. So this is another breakthrough, the smaller ones, but a real breakthrough because if we make a diagnosis of trans tyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy, we may have now a specific treatment. Uh, some of the further trials, which uh, were not uh, so positive, like Socrates preserved, investigated very siguat versus placebo in the patient with HEP-PEP. However, this, tri uh, this trial which had a primary outcome of change of baseline in anti-pro-BMP and left atrial volume uh, was not turned to be positive. Uh, later on, I will describe some of the devices of HEP, but let me uh, give you just a sneak peek what was uh, important as our uh, attempt to treat the patient of HEP with the devices. So first one was implantable baroreceptor stimulation and cardiomems congestion monitoring, which were essential for our understanding of etiopathogenesis and uh, pathology involved in the treatment of HFPF. Cardiac contractility modulation put forward uh, by uh, Bill Abraham in United States and Andrew Coates in UK 
uh, gave us the positive clinical effect uh, larger in the patient with uh, 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 preserved ejection fraction. A biological effect of this method uh, seen be remotely over time, uh, but they clearly improve the functional capacity of the patient with uh, HFPF. Obviously, uh, these results need uh, further uh, investigation and confirmation in the larger patient population. Another important uh, uh, aspect was the intratrial shard for, for passive left atrial decompensation, uh, which is a cumbersome uh, device uh, patient, uh, the device uh, uh, treatment for those patients, uh, having the idea that the patient uh, with, with shunt uh, producing the pathophys pathophysiological effect of left atrial decompression uh, had the clinical benefit out of that. To conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is important for us to understand that HEPPEF is, is not the big obstacle in treatment of our patient anymore. It is important for us to understand that SGLT2 inhibitors are giving us an excellent possibility to treat those patients. Uh, not uh, mentioning, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Magdi Abdelhamid uh, underlining that, that treating all comorbidities in heart failure uh, together uh, with the treatment of heart failure itself may be probably the way to go also in the patient with uh, HFPF. And, and I think that it is in front of us uh, the period to spread the word that uh, treatment of the HEPEP with SGLT2 inhibitors will be something uh, which uh, we may need uh, to implement all over the heart failure patients uh, uh, in uh, Europe, but also outside uh, the Europe. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Magdi, could you hear me? Uh, th yes, thank you very much, Professor Peter, for uh, this wonderful presentation. Uh, I have one question. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, you know that uh, HFPF is uh, a heterogeneous disease, a lot of comorbidities and different phenotypes. So uh, according to two important trials, uh, Baragon HF and Imperor Preserve it, if the sacrobitril valsartan and uh, uh, imbagliflozin can be given for all phenotypes or we didn't have uh, data which indicates that these drugs uh, uh, is, uh, should be individualized for uh, half bath patients. Uh, the second question related to ejection fraction. Uh, in uh, Imperor Preserved trial, uh, which is the upper cutoff level for the ejection fraction to give IMBA for uh, patients with uh, heart failure and preserved ejection fraction? Uh, it is important for us to understand that new guidelines gave us the possibility to treat our patient with HEF-REF, uh, but also with HEF-PEP with uh, several drugs. When it comes to the HEF-PEP, it's easy because only uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and empagliflozin show the effect. So uh, empagliflozin should be definitely our blockbuster in treatment of those patients. As far as the uh, sacubitil varsatan is it's concerned, uh, you know that the drug is very effective and can be given on top of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, but also the drugs have uh, an excellent clinical effect. And uh, as I pointed out, this is the first drug ever which was approved by the FDA. Even the trial was uh, borderline negative. Uh, therefore, that give us the possibility to understand that this uh, way of approaching our patient uh, with heart failure uh, is a big advantage because uh, Having in mind how difficult uh, was uh, the real diagnosis of HEPPEF, and everybody 
who practically had the possibility to uh, involve some of the HEP patient in any trials know that he needs uh, to, to look uh, at the 10 patient uh, to randomize one. Uh, therefore, now we should have some simple diagnostic approach to our patient with uh, HEPF. And if they have the symptoms and signs of heart failure, they can be given, of course, GLT2 inhibitors, starting further on, uh, depending on the comorbidity, what will be the final, uh, the final uh, uh, approach to the treatment of those patients. So uh, to make the long story, that give us the possibility uh, for the sim uh, simpler treatment now. However, it gives our uh, give us also the possibility to understand, as you already mentioning, uh, Professor Giuseppe Rosano, uh, the phenotyping approach to the patient with heart failure according to the specific phenotypes. This is for the first part of the question. The second part of the question is if we look definitely of the emperor preserved uh, data, uh, we can clearly see that uh, uh, almost 30% uh, of the patient which were treated has a borderline injection fraction. But as uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Stefan Anker, who was a PI, uh, di uh, also described, the majority of the patient had within the range of the normal ejection fraction, preserved ejection fraction. Therefore, it seems that these treatment options is excellent and that, that we need uh, to further investigate several specific uh, phenotypes in, in those, uh, uh, in the, uh, let's say, entity of the half path, uh, trying uh, to extract and to recognize other entities which may look like half path and they are specific entities like uh, I, I mentioned uh, amyloidosis or, or other specific cardiomyopathies. Professor uh, Vitag, this is uh, Mohamed Abdelreni. Uh, uh, actually, we are uh, very grateful to you on behalf of uh, my colleagues in Cairo University and on behalf of our Dean of Cairo University, uh, we are uh, uh, so grateful for your time and your contribution uh, to our Heart Failure Day. And as uh, my colleague, Professor McBee just mentioned, we are looking forward to see you uh, in Cairo. You have uh, many friends here in Egypt. The hall is full. Uh, actually, we are enjoying uh, your presentation so much. Your, your, as, as you may say, your words are the music for my ear, and I would like to thank you very much for your kindness. <laughs> Professor Guito, do you believe uh, that there is a difference between uh, DERBA, uh, gliflozin, and imbegliflozin. We know that the uh, selectivity between uh, SGL2 1 and 2 are different between the two molecules. But do you believe that uh, there is a difference or uh, it's just a class effect, especially in uh, the topic of heart failure preserved with digestion infection? What do you think? Thank you very much for an excellent question. And uh, I was, I am always asking, uh, I, I am always asked this question. And I said it's not one million dollar question, but it's fifty million dollar question. So uh, let's look at the evidence. And uh, uh, the answer is uh, within the evidence, both regarding the heart failure hospitalization, but also the mortality. So if you look at the EMPA and DAPA effect on the cardiovascular mortality, it may be different in the different trials. But since all of us uh, and some of us less, some of us more are around for many decades, it seems that, that HGLT2 inhibitors are the breakthrough in the treatment of heart failure. And uh, let me give you just one uh, historic uh, insight when uh, inhib GLT2 inhibitors were the drugs for treatment of the uh, diabetes uh, and heart failure, 
uh, we put forward and influence uh, the, the major pharmaceutical company to start uh, investigating AGLT2 inhibitors in uh, heart failure only. And that turned to be a breakthrough. Uh, so uh, what I will answer your, your question with uh, is a scientific way. And that uh, means that uh, we should uh, look at the uh, uh, heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular mortality for every particular drug. But also I'll give you the uh, clinical uh, approach or uh, clinical view on this. And that is that it seems that the, that the AGLT2 inhibitors are very important drugs. And uh, if, we, if, we, if we use empagliflozin and dapagliflozin so far, and you know that there are also some other uh, drugs uh, here, which uh, we started uh, uh, to investigate uh, before, it seems that uh, for, for some uh, pathophysiological reason, these, those drugs are extremely effect effective. And not only that, because uh, we are uh, uh, giving the talks uh, all, all around the world uh, regarding this, uh, this issue. And also uh, Magdi will be an important part of our uh, uh, Heart Failure Association workshop on the uh, complex treatment with AGLT2 inhibitors. And uh, what I would like to say it, it seems to me that uh, we need uh, to understand that not uh, for a long time in cardiology, we had the drugs with such efficacy in the, in the reduction of the heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular mortality, but also in improving functional capacity of our patient with so uh, low side effects profile, which act very early in the terms of, uh, of uh, 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 time. So you know that uh, empagliflozin starting the effect after 18 days and the DAPA after 27 days. So it seems that uh, heart failure specialists and cardiologists in general were lucky to have such an excellent uh, drug, uh, which be, will be a kind of uh, given to all our patients uh, uh, with the heart failure and only one sentence more. Egypt with uh, 100 million uh, inhabitants and, and the whole Europe uh, should be uh, our show, uh, our show test area in whom we are going to impl implement this drug as early as we can, because there is no question that losing time with our heart failure patients uh, will will uh, cost many of our heart failure patients life. Uh, one last question about the endovascular treatment of heart failure uh, preserved ejection fraction. Uh, do you personally uh, had to use such uh, an experimental modalities in the treatment of your patients? No, I did not. I did not, uh, uh, Professor Hasenfuss uh, uh, was famous in, in producing uh, intravascular shunts, but uh, that was everything before we had the, the good medical treatment. So all modalities which I showed, including uh, 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 cardiac contractility modulation, which, uh, which is uh, not easy to understand how it works, are just the anecdotal uh, uh, reports. So it, it is not proven for the treatment of, of uh, HEPF in the large number of the patient. But however, having in mind the recent advances, I think that uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and sacubitril varsartan uh, also uh, with the treatment of comorbidities will very much improve our chance to treat those patients correctly. Okay, uh, Dr. Karim, one more question, Professor Peter. Professor no problem, Karim. we yeah. can stay all day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Peter, for your presentation. I have uh, a shorter question. Before uh, the era of impagliflozin and the sacubitril valsartan, we used to describe spironolactone based upon some evidence from the top care trial. Do you think spironolactone has any potential role now after uh, the data supporting embagliflozin and sacopatrybarsartan? 
I, I deleted the slide with spironolactone because uh, uh, our big friend Burkett Piske in, in the Charité Hospital in, in Berlin is just completing the trial with the spironolactone in HEPF. Uh, however, uh, uh, I think that we should use every opportunity to treat uh, our patients better. Uh, no uh, convincing evidence that spironolactone is acting uh, positively in the patient uh, with uh, HFPEF. And uh, uh, it is important for us to understand the pathophysiological circles which are causing uh, HFPEF. I think that a big advantage for us, and let me get back uh, to, to what is the most important, is that we can treat those patients regardless, oh, the, regardless of the, of the uh, number uh, of the ejection fraction. With the spironolactone, and uh, you know that th there are some, sometimes some side effects uh, also involved, uh, we may find the treatment for for a niche of the patient, but not for them all. One, one more question, truly. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter, very much. Uh, your presentation is highly appreciated. Um, uh, I would like to ask about the importance of natriuretic peptides in patients with HEPF. Uh, does it help in decision making regarding psychobutyl valzartan versus empagliflozin in initial choice of treatment for HEPF? And second uh, question regarding uh, the presence of atrial fibrillation, which is an important component of HEPF. Should we uh, do more effort to restore sinus rhythm in such patients? What's your comments? Uh, first of all, HEPF are very important in making uh, the diagnosis in, in the emergency room. Uh, they will not influence the effect of sacubitril varsartan or empagliflozin on, on the treatment of uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, the, your, your second uh, question should uh, rely exactly on the big number of the patient with atrial fibrillation who does have, who does have PEF. Uh, so we treat them uh, both uh, in the sinus system and have PEF with, uh, with uh, empagliflozin. And regarding uh, the, the real approach, uh, it's, it's, it is important for us that the, the old uh, but clinically very successful routine, uh, and this is the, 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 the rate, uh, rate uh, 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 I mean, treat, uh, trying to establish the sinus rhythm sometimes depending on the age of the patient and the clinical condition, can be harmful and uh, regulating the heart rate uh, sometimes uh, can be enough. Obviously, uh, using the anticoagulation is an important uh, uh, clinical approach. So every patient with HEPF, like every cardiac patient uh, is specific. There is no any of the differences in treatment of uh, uh, in the effect of the of the SGLT2 inhibitors in patient with or uh, without uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, your que question is very much justified because many patients with uh, uh, HEPF has atrial fibrillation uh, and therefore this issue should be clinically solved and properly addressed. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Peter, uh, for your uh, excellent contribution to the scientific program of Heart Failure Day. Uh, we enjoyed your outstanding presentation and the fruitful discussion, and looking forward to seeing uh, this. Uh, uh, Magdi, just one second. I see that, uh, that Giuseppe is calling me. He may not have the link or something. Could you wait for a second? Okay, okay. Take your time. Uh, uh, Giuseppe. <laughs> I am in. I am in contact with Magdi now. They are. They are waiting. Do you have the the link or something? Uh, uh, Magdi uh, yeah. Abdelhamid is waiting for you to deliver the talk. <laughs> so he's uh, he's. Uh, uh, did you invited him or it was or or he was just mentioned? No, I haven't. Uh, okay. No, I haven't received anything. Okay. Okay. No problem. Thank Which you very talk? much, Magdi.
Okay. I will talk in a second. Okay. I Thank will you, communicate Maggie. with the clergy. Thank you very okay, much, please, Professor Bill. Please. Okay, good, good. So, so the thing is, you are so famous. <laughs> so, uh, for the sake of time, uh, we will postpone the presentation of uh, Dr. Giuseppe. If he is not available, I will present this presentation, uh, but uh, later on. So now, Tora uh, Mariam. Go ahead. Our case today is a case um, of heart failure patient, a 29 year old male patient, Yemenian guy, uh, not known to be diabetic or hypertensive. Uh, he's a heavy smoker and cut abuser. Uh, the main condition of the patient started two uh, months before presentation with shortness of breath on minimal exertion that has progressed to be at rest associated with orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and cough with blood tinge dyspnea. This patient also experienced uh, inframammary stitching chest pain increased with inspiration. Um, and what was very remarkable in, uh, in the complaint of the patient, uh, severe epigastric, persistent epigastric pain associated with meals, uh, but there was no uh, lower limb edema or palpitations. General examination of the patient shows uh, that the patient was fully uh, conscious or oriented to time, place, and person. Uh, he, he had uh, borderline blood pressure, 85 over 40, uh, and the, the heart rate was 104, sinus equal on both sides of an average volume with no uh, special characters. However, he was really distressed with respiratory rate, almost 38 cycles per minute. He was feverish and the saturation of room air was 98%. The head and neck examination revealed congested pulsating neck veins, tell the angle of the mandible with systolic expansion. Chest examination shows central trachea with managed air entry on both sides, more on the right base. And abdominal examination reveals hepatosplenomegaly with the abdomen. Uh, abdominal examination shows that the liver can be felt four fingers below uh, the right coastal margin, firm in character, uh, with hepatojagular reflux and tender liver. The apex was shifted uh, outward uh, and downward to the sixth left intercoastal space, midclavicular line, with systolic bulge and hyperdynamic nature, muffled S1 and accentuated S2 with pan systolic murmur over the apex radiating to the axilla. This is the ECG, 12 lead ECG, sinus rhythm with the heart rate almost 75% and uh, by, a, by atrial enlargement can be appreciated in V1 and non-specific T wave inversions. This is the uh, chest X-ray, uh, bostro anterior blue, show increasing cardiothoracic ratio with free uh, left costophrenic angle. However, there is homogeneous opacity related to the left to the right uh, lower lung zone with obliteration of the cardiac waste. The labs of the patient on admission shows anemia, uh, normal uh, total leukocytic count with shaft to the left, and uh, increase in the CRB. Also, this patient had a lot of electrolyte disturbance and elevation in the liver enzymes. The abdominal ultrasound of the patient uh, can reveal hepatomegaly with mild free pelvic collection and grade one nephropathy. This is the primary EC, uh, echo done for the patient. This is the report of it, ejection fraction 20% with dilated dimensions, severe secondary mitral regurg and mild tricuspid regurg with pulmonary artery systolic pressure 52%. So, uh, by wrapping up all the data of the patient, we reach it to this problem list, uh, acute decompensated heart failure, wet and warm, chest infection, electrolyte disturbance, and epigastric pain. We started to deal with each problem separately. Regarding acute decompensated heart failure, we started 
uh, diuretics with close follow-up of the urine output uh, and the blood pressure because the patient was uh, having a, a borderline blood pressure all the time. And we started gradual introduction of guideline directed medical therapy. This was associated with gradual improvement of the patient and the patient was shifted to oral medications. Regarding the chest infection, we collected cultures and started levofloxacin and meropenem, which was associated with improvement in the patient condition and in the uh, inflammatory markers. While the patient was on his oral medications on the 10th day of admission, he experienced again a new attack of shortness of breath and hemoptysis, and uh, he was requested a new echo, uh, and this echo will be presented with Dr. Manel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Manel Aydel, Assistant Lecturer in Cardiology Department, Cairo University. This is a part of Stern a long view done on 10th day during hospital stay of the patient. Showing dilated left atrium, 4.5. Showing dilated LED dimension, severe impairment of overall contractility. There's a large globular mass related to LED cavity and moving towards the mid cavity, freely mobile. Dilated left atrium, 4.5, aorta 2 2.4. Dilated LED dimension and diastole, 6.7, and end systolic, 5.4. There is severe mitral regurgitation with jet area 9.3. There was localized the severe pericardial effusion measuring 30 millimeter related to the right atrium and there's the mass moving to the LV cavity. The same, the mass is seen here also. And this is the view more focusing on the RV showing Another mass rate in the RV cavity, measuring 2.2, 1.5. The mass in the LV uh, was measuring 4.4, 1.9. So it's a case of LV and RV thrombi. Back to the hospital course of the patient. Uh, the patient experienced on the 15th day of admission worsening of his gastric pain. Immediately, uh, he was ordered amylase and lipase, CT mesenteric allergy to exclude mesenteric vascular uh, occlusion, which was really excluded, but revealed splenic infarction, bilateral renal infarction, and gastric wall infarction. Can be appreciated in these photos. Uh, CT abdomen and pelvis uh, with oral and IV contrast was requested by the surgeons uh, and uh, revealed portal vena thrombosis, IVC thrombosis, and surgical consultation preferred the conservative management of these patients. After one month of admission of the patient, while he was on anticoagulation for the LV and RV thrombus, the patient experienced right lower limb acute ischemia and duplex was done. This is the picture of the duplex immediate emblectomy and the ambulance was sent for the pathological uh, uh, pathology and uh, shows non-organized thrombus and confirmed it. This is the echo after one month uh, of anticoagulation of the patient. As Marion said, this uh, one month after anti anticoagulation, parasternal view, there is no mass seen, apical four chamber view, Complete disappearance of the mess. Showing this is the LV trabic wall and there's no attachment of any mess. The same complete disappearance of the RV mess as well. Uh, this is a brief. Did you have an MRI? Leave in all kida. La and no good segmental wound motion abnormality does not preclude in no dilated viral microdites or post microdites. In the masura lo waritia fil awl khalis, the pedunculated mass, the maska fil apical segment of the interventricular septum. Ana la ma shufta al haya al awl, la it min al guz ida min al septum, al apical wound mid is thin out. It does not move. Ba ulta da ischemic cardiomyopathy. لما جيتي وريتيني في الار في ايه اللي هيخلي كمان الار في يبقى افكتد في التريتوري اوف ال اي دي مش ماشيه مع بعضها وما الار في از كونتراكتنج لما خد العيان الاورال انتي كواجيليشن وريتينا الصوره دلوقتي 
السيجمنت اللي كانت ما بتتحركش بقت بتتحرك أوكي. ومش بس كده وبين ترابيكوليشنز زي ما يكون نون كومباكشن ال في لما بيبقى عندي داوت اوف ا دايليتد فيرسز ان اسكيميك ذا كلو از ذا ام ار اي مش هقدر اعتمد على الايكو بير سي دكتور ماجد عايز ياخد مني كر... لكن ما عنديش ما يفسر الار في ثرون باي الا بقى لو كارديك اوتبوت هايبر كواجلابيلتي اتشال فايبريليشن فان انا اقول انهم بايلاترال ثرون باي كده من الاول لازم ابقى الاول اقول ماسس موست بروبلي ثرون باي وبعدين الجا لانذر ايمجينج عندها سوبيريوريتي اوف تيشو كاركترايزيشن اند اوف ديفرنشيتنج مايكاردايتس او دايليتد كارديومابيتي فروم اسكيميك كارديومابس واز هي ساينس ريزم طيب انا هجاوب بس هو العيان ده يعني ويل نون كيس اوف دايليتيك كارديومابثي وهو من اليمن ويو نو ذات دايليتيك كارديومابثي از فيري كومن البريتس بروبيتي اوف كرونيك ارتري ديزيز از فيري لو في العيان ده عنده 20 حاجه و20 سنه فهو جاي اصلا بايجكشن فراكشن لو احنا شفناه باكيوت ديكومباسيت هارت فيير لو تشست انفكشن ايجكشن فراكشن كان فيري لو يس وبعد كده Second day بقى started بقى what looks like انه pulmonary impoli وبعد كده بقى الايكو ورا وهو على anticoagulation in spite of anticoagulation اللي انتوا شفتوا very fragile mobile apical thrombi LV و RV ومع ذلك impolized splenic و peripheral وكده uh, وب... شفنا بقى بعد ال anticoagulation بشهر العيان is doing well واحنا وي ستارتد بقى الجايد لاين ذا ريت ملكا ثيرابي اس جي ال 2 انهبيتور وساكوبيتري فالسر 10 بس ده طبعا كان تايتريشن فيري جراديوال واوفر مثلا 1 مانث الفاينل ايكو اللي وريته طبعا الدكتوره منال كان فيري سكسسفل اوت يعني ايجكشن فراكشن اتحسن شويه لكن اهم حاجه ان ما فيش ثرون باي خلاص العيان فانكشن كلاس 2 كان فانكشن كلاس 4 ان تي بروني بي ليفل كان عالي قوي اون فيرست داي لما شفته وبعد كده ال ان تي بروني بي نزل خالص ف اتس رير كيس ان احنا نشوف دايريتي كارد مابثي مش اسكيميك وعنده ال في وار في ثرون باي طبعا سي ام ار از ا فيري جود نون انفيزيف ايمجينج تول انه هيوري يعني مهمه قوي خاصه ان احنا كمان لو قررنا ان العين ده يتركب له اي سي دي اي سي دي لو عنده مايوكارد فايبروزيس ده واحد من البريدكتورز اوف سادن ديث اللي لازم نكونسيدر الاي سي دي بعد 3 مانث من الجايد لاين ريت ميديكال ثيرابي ستيل ايجكشن فراكشن اقل من 35% فده يبقى انديكيشن فور اي سي دي فا اي اجري وذ يو انا بس هحط نقطه اخيره بس بتتاخد في الاعتبار انه اليمني بيرسونز الكات كونسيومرز عندهم هايبر كواجلوبال ستيتس بروفن باي سيفرال ستاديز اتعملت وقت ما كان في جروب كبير من اليمني فيلورز ان هم مش بس بيجي لهم دايليتد كارديومايوباثي لكن كمان عندهم هايبر كواجلوبال ستيتس دكتور دكتور مجدي شكرا مريم شكرا منال شكرا دكتور مجدي ال في اند ار في ثرون باي كود بي اكسبلايند باي ادفانس فورم اوف كارديومايوباثي But how to explain IVCs from by and portal veins from by in such patients? Maybe has a hypercoagulable state. What do you recommend? هو طبعا الهارت فاير بيبقى معاه هايبركوجلابل ستيت يعني يعني الاكسبلينيشن في العين بيجي له ثرومبا ثروم فيري لو كارديك اوتبوت ويعني اكتيفيشن اوف بيركاوس ترياد كومن في الهارت فاير بيشنتس ولذلك اهم مسج من العيان ده ان اي عيان اكيوت ديكومباسيت هارت فاير لازم يبقى ياخد بروفلاكتيك انتي كوجريشن اند ذيس از كلاس 1 اي ريكومنديشن تو افويد الريسك اوف دي في تي بالمونري امبولس العيان ده 10 يوم ابتدى بالسيمتومز اللي كانت سجستيف اوف بالمونري امبولاي والايكو ورا ال ال في والار في ثرون باي اللي هم فيري بيج بس ساتش دايجنوزس ود هاف امباكت اون لونج تيرم تريتمنت طبعا هايبر كوجري ستيت بقى شود بي رول اوت في العيان ده طبعا ديفينتلي ديفينتلي I think it's a very interesting case, <clears throat> but you know that um, we, it is very interesting case, but we used the uh, streptokinase for ventricular uh, uh, clots and it dissolves the clot in about two or three days faster than the anticoagulation. And we published this about more than 20 years, you know. 
So we can use the chupacarius to shorten the hospitalization period. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Worry about. Worry. Doctor Marie, mo doctor, man, he worry. But the literature review, and it's very rare case. Yeah. There are some case reports on the bilateral from by for the dilated cardiac. The incidence of left ventricular thrombosis is not that high. 80% of them are ischemic and 20% only are due to dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, it used to be underestimated and now it is uh, improved. The, the diagnosis improved by uh, new technologies in echo and CMR. Uh, the risk factors for development uh, left ventricular thrombosis, especially for heart failure, is reduced in the contractility of the ventricle. The more uh, reduced the ejection fraction and the more dilated the ventricles, uh, the higher the risk of the patient to develop uh, left ventricular thrombosis due to stagnation of blood. Also, the hypercoagulability uh, state of the patient of heart failure, as Dr. Magdi said, and the diuretics, which are one of the main pillars in the treatment of heart failures, uh, result in dehydration and increase the hypercoagulability state of the patient. Uh, two diagnostic mo modalities are used. Uh, first is the echo, which is safe, uh, cheap, and uh, uh, available. Uh, and the, the, the diagnosis of left ventricular thrombi with echo improved with the use of contrast agent and the improvement in the technology where it appears as smooth contour, having uh, moves with each cycle. Um, and uh, uh, the more the, protu the protruding of the left ventricle uh, of the thrombus in the left ventricle and the higher the mobility of the thrombus, the more the risk for development embolic event. CMR is the gold standard for the diagnosis of, uh, of, uh, of uh, left ventricular thrombi and uh, sensitivity improved uh, in the 9th to 12th day. How should we use the anticoagulation according to the ESC guidelines, the use of vitamin K anticoagulation? Use of uh, vitamin K anticoagulation is studied with the target INR 2.5 for six months, and the use of uh, anticoagulation for less than three months is associated with the higher recurrence rate. Uh, the treatment of persistent or recurrent left ventricular thrombi, which is common in 18.5% of the patient, uh, is, uh, is debatable, where uh, the use of left ventricular uh, anticoagulation for left ventricular thrombi for more than six months is where the, the, the left ventricular thrombus become more calcified and initialized with less risk of development of thromboembolic event is debatable. Uh, Limited data are available for the use of new wax, uh, and there is a debate about the, the dose used for treatment of left ventricular thrombi with no wax. Uh, two case reports were found in literature. The first in the Journal of Medicine for a 76 year old male patient, sinatrism with dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, after being discharged uh, by one day, he became he came to with left uh, limb paresis, and see and the MRI showed uh, multiple cerebral infarction with echo uh, showing two mobile thrombi in the left ventricle. The main message uh, from this case was uh, that left ventricular thrombi can occur in sinus uh, rhythm and in patients with reduced ejection fraction undergoing treatment. Another case in the European Heart Journal with the, uh, a patient with 66, uh, 66 year old with no previous cardiac history, uh, echo shows ejection fraction 17% and LVRV thrombus. Uh, this patient, in this patient, they did uh, uh, investigation for hypercoagulable state and all were negative. The patient only received the heparin and vitamin K antagonist and follow-up CMR was free. Uh, this is the discharge uh, medications uh, for our patient, spironolactone, sacroptrin, valsartan, carvidilol, SGL2, evapradine, marivan, three milligram ounce daily, PPI, and potassium syrup. Thank you. هو طبعا كل الكيس ريبورتس دي كمان موريه ان هم بيستخدموا يعني وارفرين مش نوكس وي دينت هاف ان ايفيدنس للنوكس انا بس عندي سؤال طب ما دي يعني ذيس از ذيس كيس يو كونسيدر ات 
idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy? Yeah. Idiopathic? I think the cut uh, has a great role. يعني احنا ما بنشوفش كتير الترومباي في الباي فنتريكال في الحالات التالتة الكارديوميوباتي الماركت امبروفمنت اوف ذا بيشنت افتر ستوبينج كات اي ثينك هي ستوبت كات ميك سنس ذات ذا كات از ريسبونسبل فور سم اوف ذا مانيفستيشنز وي سي اف يو نوتس ذا فيرست ايمج اوف ذا ايكو كارديوغرافي دان باي مانيل سيفير جلوبولار سفيريكال ليفت فنتريكال اند ذن في النكست ايمجز كومبليت rather than the thrombi. I think Bardo la matala in the hypercoagulant state is negative. I think it is related to the cut mainly. With follow up of this patient, he may return to near normal left ventricular function if he stopped cut, if this is the etiology. He was not receiving optimal medical treatment, bad line direct medical therapy, number two. Number two, he had a comorbidity, he had a chest infection, and he had a decompensated heart failure. The cut may be prothrombotic, so he can do dilated cardiomyopathy. Of course, this is a very rare case. Of course, it's a reverse. زي كل التوكسيك ما هو ما لحقناش بقى احنا يعني شهر او شهر ونص انا قصدي فولو اب ذيس بيشنت ويل ميك ات فعلا از كيس ريب يس طب انا اسمحوا لي بس الاول عايز اشكر مريم على التقديم حلقه ممتازه يا مريم برافو عليكي واشكر كمان الدكتوره منال على الايكو كده هو دكتوره منال اتفضل استريحي احنا عندنا يوم طويل بالمناسبه احنا عندنا لسه ست محاضرات انا عندي مجلس اسم الساعه 3 فا يعني بس استاذنكم ان احنا نقلل شويه من الدسكشن ونخليها دايما في نهايه البرزنتيشنز عشان نعمل انترابشن احنا هنسمح بسؤالين دكتور محمد الرملي اتفضل لا انا كنت عايز لا تمام مجدي وات وود يو كومند از ان انتي كوجيليشن ان ساتش بيشنتس ان ذا فيوتشر هندي ايه بالظبط؟ هي شود بي طبعا فور لايف اورال انتي كوجيليشن العين ده اوكي وارفرين طبعا ديفينتلي بيشنت ويز اكيوت ديكومبنسيت هارت فيلر ان هوسبيتال وات وود يو كومند؟ اني بيشنتس هوسبيتاليز ويز اكيوت هارت فيلر بروفيلاكتيك لو موليكولار ويت هابرين During hospitalization to full avoid dose. the risk of full, full DBT pulmonary risk. Full dose. No, no, prophylactic dose. Just prophylactic dose. Class 1A recommendation in the guidelines. Tamim. Tamim. Tul Karim. Hoa, just uh, idea. Hal ma lafetsha nazarna na layan da fagah galu fever, lung infected, bilateral thrombi, right and left, outside the heart, and rapidly improve it within short period of time, which is not the norm, to near, near normal. How can be acute precipitating inflammatory or non-inflammatory uh, factor precipitate such events? How do we see the eosinophils? How do we see the autoimmune profile? There's no evidence that the church strauss or hyper-eosinophilia or something. It's acute decompensated heart failure due to chest infection, severe heart failure function plus four, He received the diuresis, antibiotics, tassin, CRP nasal, after that, hemoptysis, echo, thrombi, full anticoagulation, titrating medications, when the blood pressure is allowed to be used before the charge, psychopathy, and so on. We have to do it with SGL2 inhibitor, and it happens within two weeks. But of course, during the course, there was a lot of الثرومبوامبوليك مانيفستيشنز اللي هي السبلينيك واللور لمب اسكيميا. I mean two weeks uh, to regain complete recovery or near recovery is not the norm even with advanced uh, GTMT. Maybe he had something else لان ده هيدينا انسايت هل هنمشي على الاورال انتي كوجلان لونج Any heart failure patients with history of thromboembolism he is a candidate for oral anticoagulation for life. Now we have uh, to close the first session. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, uh, Magdi. Uh, thank you, uh, Mariam. And now uh, let me invite the uh, chairpersons of second session, uh, okay. Professor Hisham Salah Azza Farag, Muhammad Ramli, Dr. Wafi Al Arusi to chair the second session. You can see.
خليك خليك بكاش يلا يا اوكي يعني طبعا انا شايف السيشن الاولانيه جميله واي هوب السكند سيشن ويل بي از بيوتيفول يعني احنا النهارده عندنا انا شايف يعني فيري نايس بروجرام وان شاء الله يعني تبقى يوم ظريف جدا بحي طبعا دكتور مجدي ودكتور محمد عبد الغني على الحاجات الساينتفك اللي احنا اول ثرو وي ار جوينج ثرو جميله جدا يعني احنا السبيكر الاول طبعا برضو احب احكي الكوتش بيرسونز معايا في السيشن طبعا احنا مش قاعدين على سيت اب يعني بتاع منصه ولا حاجه ولكن كلهم معروفين يعني بروفيسور عزه وبروفيسور رملي الفيرست سبيكر هيكون دكتور احمد سمير هيدينا موضوع ظريف جدا براكتيكال ريمايندرز ان اكيوت هارت فيلير الحقيقه احمد من الناس المتميزين جدا كنا لسه جايبين سيرتك امبارح يا احمد بس بالخير يعني لاول مره كنا بنتكلم على محتاجين سبيكر يكون نولجبل في حاجه معينه هبقى اقول لك هي ايه او كريم هيبلغك والحقيقه قالوا ان احمد سمير واحد من الناس المتميزين وانا توتالي اجري سو وي ار اكسبكتنج ا فيري نايس برزنتيشن اتفضل My old professors at what uh, later I need to uh, be presenting in front of uh, all my uh, distinguished professors. Um, um, my presentations will be essentially focusing on some of the forgotten practical reminders that we need to put in mind in managing acute heart failure. Um, my agenda will go through that acute heart failure, what is different in it from the chronic one. And the universal algorithm for the management is always there, but we need to seek the triggers. Treatment starts usually before the decompensation. We need, and this will be the, the bigger part of my presentation, to involve the patient in our plans and in his treatment. And lastly, not to forget the iron deficiency. Um, heart failure, the universal definition. It has been agreed that heart failure is the clinical syndromes with symptoms and signs caused by structural and or functional cardiac abnormality that is corroborated by elevated natriuretic peptide levels and or objective evidence of pulmonary uh, or systemic congestion. But actually, this definition um, more suits with the chronic heart failure that we see every day. However, acute heart failure might have few but discrete uh, differences that it is the heart failure when it represents the new onset heart failure in people not known to have cardiac dysfunctions and more frequently as acute decompensation of previously chronic stabilized heart failure heart failure as acute presentation is very common uh, and uh, actually represents the leading cause of hospital admissions in people Uh, 65 years or older in many of the registries, the well-established uh, registries. But what would cause the worsening of heart failure? What would decompensate a chronic uh, stabilized heart failure? Actually, this is the natural history. Um, for a patient with heart failure, his natural history would be like uh, this figure, which was um, introduced in the literature for the heart failure management since 2005, uh, that every now and then he will have a worsening heart failure event that causes some symptoms and signs. Usually he recovers, but, but the recovery is often incomplete. So worsening heart failure events represents progressive manifestations despite guidelines directed medical therapy usually is associated with heart failure hospitalization or indication for hospitalization because Commonly, it needs IV diuretics. These worsening events usually um, are insidious and usually have incomplete recovery, not to the very baseline that he was before that worsening event. Um, uh, the main points that I have uh, added to my uh, lecture comes from the 2017 update for the 2013 American guidelines for heart failure and the um, Uh, um, definitions for heart failure in 2021, uh, the 2021 guidelines, and lastly, 
And I find it a very uh, informative, concise document where the NICE guidelines pushes and updates essentially targeting the acute heart failure, not like a um, small section within uh, the global heart failure management guidelines. Um, this is the universal classification for heart failure coming essentially based on the Forrester's classification. Uh, and it has been uh, um, simplified into the current management into the four general squares, warm, wet versus uh, cold, uh, sorry, warm, cold versus wet and dry. And um, usually it um, uh, represents the, um, the a spectrum of good perfusion versus hypoperfusion and the spectrum of congestion or a wet patient versus a dry patient. Um, and actually this classification is translated into the universal algorithm for managing a patient coming with an acute decompensatory heart failure, where I ask myself the first uh, um, hallmark question, he is congested or fluid overloaded. What should I do? The next question in the algorithm, is he perfused or hypoperfused? Perfused, I start directly with diuretics. Hypoperfused, this will get um, um, the right side of the algorithm. Um, if he is perfused, I start with diuretics managed to uh, go well, fine. If not, I increased the diuretic dose. I uh, go for sequential blockade. If he's refractory, I might consider the renal replacement therapy or ultra filtration or so. Oh, um, on the other hand, or uh, in our uh, right uh, arm of uh, algorithm, if he was hypoperfused, we start probably with inotropes. If it did the job and the diuretics start to be effective, uh, that set. If not, we consider to add vasopressors uh, and so forth. So universal classification, yes, it's there. Universal algorithm that mandates the initial management, yes, it's there, but this is not the complete management. The complete management needs a very important question, an additional question to be asked, what is the trigger for this time decompensation? And the guidelines actually mentioned the most common decompensation causes and mentioned that these causes needs to be identified. And I start to correct or reverse whatever is reversible among them within the first 60 to 120 minutes, the first two hours from the patient's admission. We need to identify what was the trigger for his decompensation. Actually, the champet have been in the guidelines since 2016, but other common causes that not are listed in this list while, while we uh, found them very often and commonly um, causing scenarios for the dehydration is uh, in our community that patients are not adherent to their therapies or not adherent diet, essentially the salt restriction have been receiving non-steroidal steroidal chemotherapies, particularly in the COVID era, um, having undergoing or being prepared for surgery, undergoing stress or critical illness, and lastly, acute cerebral insult. Why seeking the trigger is so important and why we are shedding a lot of lights on, because each trigger of these might have a different phenotype or a presentation and each of these triggers cause the decompensation for the patient with a certain and a different, uh, uh, different mechanism. These mechanisms have different hemodynamic profiles, different presentations, and obviously this will be translated into different approaches in managing and treating and correcting uh, these patients. And this will take me to the second important and critical reminder in managing heart failure that we need to educate our patients and educate ourselves the art of remote monitoring. The remote monitoring for heart failure patients should start with the home, and this should be integrated with the heart failure clinic. Probably there sits a specialist or a young doctor, but he needs to be following monitoring either during the visits or remotely from the patient's home phone calls or telemetries. All these needs to be uh, integrated into up titrating and modifying his heart failure therapy, which should be the case. This will always be translated into less emergency departments and less hospitalizations. Um, I will go uh, for the coming few slides into uh, 
with the remaining parts of the universal algorithm that inotropes and or vasopressors are not routine in all uh, acute heart failure patients, they should only be considered when uh, the patient is gravely hypoperfused or we have a reversible cardiogenic shock condition. Mechanical assist devices. Um, I would say that we need to change our look into them. We need to think, discuss, and consider them early enough. Not all the patients will reach uh, um, the condition or the um, time that we are going to implant uh, the uh, MCS, but all the patients need to be considered for it to know exactly when they will need it bad and should uh, receive it now. Uh, the ventilatory support, again, it is not routine for all acute heart failure patients. Um, the non-invasive ventilation like uh, CPAP or non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation needs to be started for patients with pulmonary edema, severe dyspnea, and acidemia that are not being compensated appropriately or corrected, and occasionally as adjunct to medical therapy if he is not responding uh, to the simple oxygen uh, uh, supplementation. Invasive ventilation should be uh, uh, go uh, when for uh, when the patient is in respiratory failure, reduced consciousness, and or getting physically exhausted on the non-invasive measures. Uh, ultrafiltration again is not routine, but it is spared only for people with acute heart failure um, uh, who have a confirmed refractory diuretic resistance. The diuretics again, it's. Um, has um, an algorithm for fine tuning. Uh, we usually judge it simply with the urine output, either it is good or not satisfactory, but um, a, a critical role for a spot urinary sodium sample taken after two hours from starting uh, the diuresis have proved to be uh, well correlated with the prognosis the duration of hospitalization and the re-hospitalization after discharge for heart failure patients. To make these figures simpler, I guess we need to all uh, remember that urinary spot sodium is targeting around 60, while the urinary output volume is targeting around the double of it, 120 milliliters per hour, judged uh, with, uh, as an average of the first six hours from starting the diuresis. Beta blockers. If the patient is in beta blocker, be very resistant to the notion that you stop it. Occasionally, we can reduce it, take it to half, but do not stop it except if the patient is excessively bradycardic, is developing heart lock, or is in a frank cardiogenic shock. If it is not, um, um, was, was not able to be continued, uh, you should try to start or restart it during the hospitalization before discharge, resist the notion of discharging the patient without beta blockers and planning to start it at home. And whenever we started it during the hospital, the patient needs to remain in the hospital for at least 48 hours uh, before judging him stable to be discharged. Um, the bigger part of my lecture is uh, the importance of involving and partnering with the patient in his management of the heart failure. The patient needs to have and will understand that there is um, a bigger role for him in his management. He needs to have some kind of checklists to look every day, every week, periodically for himself if he is in the gray uh, in the green zone where everything is uh, in the utmost and the stable conditions, or in the borderline orange zone where there are many concerns that he has to identify and report in the telemetry or um, uh, the remote monitoring systems, or he is developing the red flags that probably necessitates uh, a visit or uh, hospitalization. The patient should understand well what is heart failure, why he is having such manifestations of heart failure, what is the explanation for whatever, and he should be motivated uh, well uh, if he understood what can uh, cause him um, to um, um, experience a worsening heart failure event, how to prevent this before its occurrence. Um, actually, when I went through the Mayo Clinic website and the AHA website, I have found a lot uh, of such flyers that can um, be easily translated and co-opted into our culture and our socioeconomic 
population uh, that we can um, deliver and conduct these messages to our Egyptian heart failure patients. Uh, we need all to educate our patients that treatment starts before the compensation, that he should be uh, periodically self-monitoring his body weight. He should know by well what are the common precipitating factors. Um, my take home message at the end of uh, my lecture is the prevention of the compensation is the best remedy. Management starts from home. Yes, there is universal classification. Yes, a universal algorithm for initial management, but identifying and reversing the trigger is a corner store in management, partnering with our patients, educating them about the triggers for ADHF, roles of therapies, targets of the rehabilitation has a critical and a crucial and actually a missing role in our practice. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, very nice presentation. And to the point, just for the sake of time, uh, we will allow uh, one just one question. It was self explanatory. It was self-explanatory. <تصفيق> a very a very nice الحقيقه يعني. طيب انا بس عايز اسالك حاجه يعني انت ذكرت ان there are different phenotypes for patients presenting with acute heart failure. والفينوتايبس دولت ممكن نعتبرهم اللي هم مثلا الوورم ويت والكولد دراي والكلام ده مش كده؟ تو باي تو but in the same time, there are different ways of treating such patients according to the phenotype. But the important thing is that we don't forget the point of triggering. Triggering is very important. Even if a person has acute heart failure, still there may be a trigger. And the important trigger, of course, is ischemia in most of the cases. And this is a very important way of tackling patients in acute heart failure. Exactly. So, we'll move to the second speaker. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, we will move to uh, Dr. Walid Ammar. Uh, he will talk about new drugs in heart failure management. Of course, we all know that the great challenge in cardiology is the new drugs that uh, reduces mortality. Uh, طبعا of course the main field في الدراجز دي هي الهارت فيليير. Uh, دكتور وليد عمار استاذ القلب في القصر العيني uh, will give us uh, his uh, nice lecture insights. اتفضل يا وليد. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم جميعا شكرا جزيلا لاختي العزيزه دكتور عزه all the chair persons I would like to congratulate دكتور عبد الغني ودكتور مجدي for excellent organization for such a very scientific day. Uh, so, we are facing uh, a growing pandemic of heart failure. And uh, despite we have a lot of uh, new medications in the last 10 years that improved the outcome of patients with heart failure, like decreasing mortality and decreasing hospitalization, even after the paradigm and the HF or Emperor used with the landmark trials or new medications or ARNI or SGLT2, we still have 20 to 30 percent risk of having such catastrophic event of mortality or heart failure hospitalization. So we have a residual risk despite all the pillars of comprehensive heart failure treatment, and such risk is even higher with patients with worsening heart failure that at higher risk of mortality and hospitalization. So we are still looking for a new pathways for treating such high risk patients. And one of these uh, new uh, treatment options is to look for another pathway to treat such patients. One important pathway in heart failure is the nitric oxide uh, cyclic guanyl cyclase cyclic GMEP pathway. This is important in physiological system. And in heart failure, we have evidence of oxidative stress and inflammation that cause impairment of endothelial nitric oxide synthesis and the function both are affected in heart failure. So we have deficiency of cyclic GMEP that may cause myocardial dysfunction and also vascular dysfunction. What about uh, Versiquat? Versiquat is uh, a new molecule that directly and indirectly improves the function of cyclic GMP. 
it increases the sensitivity of soluble guanyl cyclase to endogenous nitric oxide and also directly increases the action of cyclic guanyl cyclase, soluble cyclase on GTP to increase cyclic GMP. So this way with Versiquat, we hope to have reduction of myocardial stiffness, myocardial in myocardial thickening, improve remodeling and prevent fibrosis. And on a vascular level, we may have improvement in decreasing arterial constriction and vascular stiffness. Based on this rationale and patients with worsening heart failure despite guideline directed medical therapy, those are considered at high risk for heart failure events. Versiquat, which is a novel soluble guanyl cyclase, may have an improvement in such patients. So the Victoria trial was a large multi-center, placebo-controlled, double-blinded, randomized trial that recruited patients at high risk. Such patients have heart failure class 2 to 4 when injection correction less than 45. All patients should have guideline-based heart failure therapies, established doses over the past one week at least. In addition to having this baseline characteristics, should have worsening event in the form of either heart failure hospitalization or need for recent IV diuretic use, in addition to high levels of natriuretic peptides and even higher in the percent of atrial fibrillation. About 5,000 patients were randomized to have Versiguat 10 milligrams oral once daily or placebo on top of a standard of care therapy, including all medications, RAS or ARNI, mineral corticoid antagonist, and beta blockade. After about three years follow up, we have 10% relative risk reduction of the composite endpoints of cardiovascular death or first heart failure hospitalization. Apparently, this relative risk reduction is small, just 10%. But in terms of absolute risk reduction, we will find that it is very high, 4.2%. Almost the same like ARNI in the paradigm. Why this relative risk reduction was translated into a higher absolute risk reduction because such patients are at higher risk. So any relative risk reduction could be translated more to absolute risk reduction, despite a relatively small relative risk reduction. Regarding secondary endpoints of Victoria trial, cardiovascular death was not significantly decreased, but heart failure hospitalization was the main component of reduction of such endpoints. And finally, for the composite of all cause deaths and hospitalization, we have significant 10% relative risk reduction of all cause deaths or hospitalization. And more important is that the effect appears very early just after three months of randomization. So in such high risk patients with worsening heart failure, despite standard of care therapy, adding a Versiquat may have a beneficial effect just after three months of starting such molecule. So in conclusion of Victoria trial, this trial addressed a significant unmet need for patients at higher risk for mortality and hospitalization. It's once daily medication, it has C pharmacol logical, pharmacokinetic, and pharmacodynamic profile with a number needed to treatment of just 24. It was a global research perspective and it represents a big step forward in treatment of very high risk patients. How this trial affected the most recent guidelines for heart failure? Yes, it was important. It was incorporated into the guidelines as a class 2P level of evidence P on top of standard of care therapy, ACE or ARNI, beta blockade, and MRA antagonists for patients with heart failure with worsening events of heart failure. The second target of therapy for heart failure that would like to comment is omicaptive micarpel. This molecule is a first-in-class cardiac myosin activator. It augments the speed of ATP hydrolysis. Therefore, it accelerates the production of actin myosin complexes, which leads to more forcible systolic contraction. It produces a dose-dependent increase in systolic ejection time stroke volume and ejection fraction. And more importantly, it does not increase myocyte intracellular calcium or increase myocardial oxygen consumptions. We know these two factors have resulted in increased mortality in previous trials with myotropes or inotropic agents in setting of chronic heart failure. We have two smaller trials before the landmark trial. This were, this were the atomic heart failure trial for IV omicaptive micarpel and patients with acute heart failure. It was small size trial, but double blinded placebo controlled and increases the systolic ejection time, decreased in the systolic dimension, and it was well tolerated. It was not powered enough to have clinical outcome. However, the results were positive 
and warrant further investigation of omicaptive and an oral medication in chronic heart failure patients. The next trial was a still a small one, a phase two trial, cosmic heart failure trial with an oral, this time oral omicaptive micropel. It showed a pharmacokinetic based uptake ratio. They started with a small dose and went up with higher doses of omicaptive micropel. And this also showed improvement in systolic function in addition to an improvement of NT pro PNB. Now we have another marker of improvement in addition to echo findings in a lab finding of improvement of any terminal pro PNB. In addition, we have minimal troponin release without evidence of ischemia in such trial cosmic heart failure. These two trials, atomic and cosmic, paved the way for the larger clinical trial, which was a galactic heart failure trial, which was a double blind randomized placebo controlled multi center trial to assess the efficacy and safety of imicaptive micarbel on mortality and morbidity in coronic heart failure patients. They recruited high risk patients, ejection fraction less than 35%. NEHA class 2 to 4 with elevated natriuretic peptides with recent hospitalization, whether acute or in the previous one year. Patients were, were randomized to omicaptive micarbel 25 milligrams orally that can be increased in subsequent dosing and visits versus placebo. At follow up, the drug was able to some extent just 8% relative risk reduction of the composite ending point of first heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death. This effect was observed without evidence of increase in the risk of myocardial ischemic events or ventricular arrhythmias or deaths from cardiovascular dose, and it's a very important notion in such outcome. On the other hand, omicaptive micarbel did not improve any of the secondary outcomes. It did not reduce cardiovascular deaths. It did not change the quality of life in Kansas City questionnaire. It did not decrease heart failure hospitalization or all call deaths. But important finding in galactic heart failure was the effect of baseline ejection fraction on the outcome. Patients with lower ejection fraction gained more benefit from the drug. We know in this trial, all the patients had ejection fraction less than 35%. But at a cutoff point of 22 ejection fraction below this figure, patients achieved more benefit with omicaptive micarbel than patients with higher ejection fraction. In conclusion, patients with HFRIV this omicaptive micarbel reduced the composite endpoint of first heart failure event or cardiovascular death. Treatment effect increased with decreasing ejection fraction. No difference in serious adverse events, whether ischemic or arrhythmic events. No adverse effect on blood pressure, heart rate, potassium hemostasis, or renal function. Did galactic heart failure affected the guidelines for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Actually not. This drug is still in assessment. It is not yet FD approved. It is not released licensed for heart failure. However, in the future, it may be able to be considered in addition to standard of therapy for heart failure to reduce the risk of uh, mortality on hospitalization. And thank you very much. Thank you, Arid, for uh, this very elaborative uh, talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions? وليد كان عادة يعني excellent presentation يعني very presentable دائما يعني أنا بس سؤالي بالرغم من ال study يعني حلوة جدا بتاعت ال versi وات وكده why in the guidelines it's just a class two B indication على عكس trial تانية اللي أنت جبت سرتها على الأرني ال paradigm heart failure it just immediately from one single large scale trial it transferred in the guidelines as a class one شكرا دكتور شيم طبعا هو سؤال صعب يعني والدكتور مجدي اظن هو اقدر بالرد عليه انما انا هحاول ارد برضه طبعا الاستدي كاليبر خلينا نشوف ايه هم البيشنت سبسيتس اللي كلمنا عليهم في الفيكتوريا وبعدين الماجنيتيود اوف ذا ترايل اوكي تمام طيب فهنا احنا بنتكلم على سبسيت اوف بيشنتس وذ ورسننج هارت فيلير فالفيكتوريا مش ما خدتش كل كرونيك هارت فيلير وما كانت على جروب معين وهو ده اللي ترانسليتد في جايد لاينز اللي احنا تو ريكومند فيرسي جوات هم بس في دول ان هم ورسننج هارت فيلر ديسبايت الاوبتيمال ميديكال ثيرابي انكلودنج الارني والام ار اي والبيتا بلوكرز ثاني حاجه هي الماجنيتيود اوف ذا ترايل اتسلف احنا بنتكلم في 5000 بيشنتس على لونج على فولو اب انترميديتس نوت لونج تيرم فولو اب فالماجنيتيود بارادايم فيرسس فيكتوريا جاستيفاي ريكومنديشنز كلاس 1 فيرسس كلاس 2 اوكي هو الفيكتوريا بتادرس سبيسيفيك جروب اوف بيشنت زي ما قال الدكتور وليد اللي هو العنين اللي هم عندهم ورسننج هارت فيلير اوكي 
البنفيتس كانت كورليتد مع الليفل اوف انتي برون بي يعني العيانين عندهم فيري هاي ليفل اوف انتي برون بي الاوتكم واز نوت جود والمورتاليتي بنفيت مش موجوده مينلي ريدكشن في الهوسبيتاليزيشن فبالتالي عشان الاستادي دي يعني كوندكتد في عيانين فيري هاي ريسك معظمهم اللي هم الورسنج وريكارنت هوسبيتاليزيشن وادفانسد هارت فيير ما فيش مورتاليتي بنفيت جاست ريدكشن في الهوسبيتاليزيشن فبالتالي هي Only one study, فبالتالي it's class to be recommendation. بس اللي أنا قصدي فيه إنه كان ممكن جدا لو ال results very impressive زي اللي شفناه في الparadigm كانت تنزل في guidelines as those in worsening with worsening heart failure in its a class one level of evidence كذا. بس هي الحقيقة إنه في some of the endpoints زي ما الدكتور ماجد قال including the mortality ما تحسنتش في كل subgroups ولا حاجة. صح. وعدد العيانين التوتال الموجود في الاستدي كمان ما كانش as big as in the paradigm heart failure هو في في دلوقتي اون جوينج ستاديز على الفيريس جوات ده اكيد يعني وهو هينزل قريب على فكره في مصر خلاص يعني اتس اباوت تو بي ان ذا ماركت فيري سون يعني ميرسي جدا جدا اه كريم هو هو حد يديله المايك طيب الجروب اوف بيشنت اللي انكلودد في الفيكتوريا وفي الجلاكتيك هارت فيلير دولي زي ما دكتور مجدي قالوا فيري هاي ريسك جروب وكانوا برضو يعني اللي هم الورسنج اوف هارت فيلير جروب يعني احنا لو شفنا اي ثينك كان في ترايل اسمها اللايف ترايل دي كانت كومبيرنج ال ال الساكوبيتريل فالزارتان فيرسس اليوجوال مانجمنت ان ذا بيشنت ويز ادفانسد هارت فيلير دولي اللي هما كان الريجكشن فراكشن بتاعهم فيري لو In this trial, Bardo, the Arni Mahaash Bay Nakhtarna, rather than in how a drug that quays or a letter, then in very sequat can add on drug monk in your conquest. We had a very, very difficult future with the medication coming in. It will become very difficult in the future with any medication coming in, and we have so a lot of benefits more and more. لانك انت اوريدي يو ار هافينج فيري جود ميديكيشنز كامينج ان سيجنيفيكنتلي ريديوسينج ذا مورتاليتي اند ذا موربيديتي وبالتالي ذا اديشنال بنفيت المتوقع از جيتنج سمولر اند سمولر وبالتالي ات واز فيري انتليجنت ان ذيس ستدي تو جيت ذا مور سيريسلي ال بيشنتس هو ار نوت اكشولي ريسبوندينج تو ذا يوجوال ريجيمنتس بنشكرك جدا يا وليد انا على تو بوينتس اللي حضرتك قلتهم قبل ما امشي هنا ان الامبروفمنت بدا بعد ثلاث شهور من الراندمايزيشن which is very important ثاني حاجه ان الابسوليوت ريسك ريدكشن كان ذا سيم از ذا بارادايم ديسبايت ريليتيف ريسك ريدكشن كان اقل انهم هي الريسك زي ما حضرتك قلت شكرا يا دكتور شكرا جزيلا ميرسي قوي قوي اور لاست سبيكر ان ذيس سيشن دكتور محمد حسن ويل سبيك اباوت مانجمنت اوف ادفانسد هارت فيل ما بعد الميديكيشنز بقى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم جود افتنون افريون زي ما استاذي دكتور محمد رملي قال ما بعد الميديكيشنز يعني سو ويل فوكس ان ماي برزنتيشن اون بيشنتس ويز ادفانسد هارت فيلير از وي اول نو هارت فيلير هاز اولويز بين ا ميزري ديزيز ويز ا سيجنيفيكنتلي هاي مورتاليتي هاي ريت اوف هوسبيتاليزيشن بور كواليتي اوف لايف اند سيجنيفيكنت ايكونوميك بيردن اند انفورشنتلي many patients progress to a phase of advanced heart failure, what's called stage D or refractory heart failure. And unfortunately, the prevalence of this subgroup of patients is increasing due to a growing number of heart failure patients, due to aging of population, due to better treatment and providing our patients more treatment so lead to more survival. And this uh, uh, subgroup of patients are increasing. And unfortunately, they have much poorer uh, prognosis. The prognosis of one year mortality for those patients reach up to 25 to 75%. But importantly, how can we define advanced heart failure? In order to say that this patient has advanced heart failure, he should fulfill these four criteria. First one, the patient has severe or persistent symptoms of heart failure, class three or four, severe cardiac dysfunction, and this could be reduced ejection fraction, ejection fraction less than 30% or isolated RV failure, or significant 
uh, diastolic dysfunction, persistently high in terminal pro-BMB, or severe valvular abnormalities, which is not operable. So severely reduced ejection fraction is not required for diagnosis of advanced heart failure because you could have advanced heart failure, advanced half-BEF, or patient with valve disease with good ejection fraction but has a refractory heart failure. The third criteria is you should have episodes of congestion, either pulmonary or systemic, or episodes of low cardiac uh, output that requiring enotropes or vasopressors, and for severe impairment of exercise capacity or objective evidence like six-minute walk test, less than uh, 300 meters, or doing a cardiopulmonary exercise with low peak exercise um, uh, oxygen uh, capacity, uh, less than 50% of the predictive value. should have the four criteria in order to diagnose advanced heart failure. How to manage these patients? We know that heart transplantation is a gold standard. It offers a very good long-term therapeutic option with significant survival benefit. Actually, the one-year survival uh, after heart transplant now is near 90%. The median survival for our patients around 12.5 years. But it's not available for all patients. It's available for only minority of patients. The total number of heart transplants worldwide now does not exceed 3,500. We, many patients die on the waiting list. Transplant program is not available in all countries, and still we have contraindications to transplant. That's why there is this stimulated the need that we need more options like mechanical circulatory support. And we know that the field of VADs have been progressed significantly, starting by uh, first generation, very large pump implanted in the abdomen. And then now we have a third generation with very small centrifugal pump implanted intrapericardially that pump the blood from the ventricle to the aorta, keeping the heart in place. And there is now, according to the Intermax registry, the interagency registry of mechanical assisted circulatory support, there is a year to year increase in the utility of VET as uh, in patients with advanced heart failure, mainly for left ventricular uh, support, very small patients for RV support and small number of total artificial hearts. And the new generations of VAT significantly improved the survival. Now the two-year survival reach up to 65%, maybe 70% in clinical practice. And the old generation, the two-year survival was maximum 23%. Mechanical circulatory support can be used as um, a bridge to uh, decision. So if the patient has an acute decompensation uh, with severely deteriorating with cardiogenic shock, you can put a short-term mechanical circulatory support in order to see what's the next decision for this patient. Could be as a bridge to transplantation. And nowadays, 40% of patients with transplant actually receive uh, VADs as a bridge to transplantation. It could be as a bridge to recovery, and the data on the literature is extremely valuable. The recovery rate ranging between 6% up to in some series of Professor Yakub reach up to 75% in selective patients, young patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. But it could be as a destination therapy. The patient lives uh, for his whole life on ventricular assessed device. Now we have also what's called total artificial heart. And the difference that total artificial heart, it replaces both ventricles with the valves, with two pumps. So valves skip the heart, just put a pump to to uh, pump the blood from the ventricle to the aorta, but the artificial heart, you are replacing both ventricles with the valves with two pumps. The problem that to, is a challenge to manage two pumps. We know there is a ventricular interdependency. You are, if you unload the ventricle much more, so this will lead to ballooning of the other ventricle. If you overload it, you, 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 you unloaded this ventricle, so one, if one ventricle is ballooned, so it will impair the filling of the other ventricle. So managing this is this, is really difficult. And if you look at the data from the Intermax registry, the one year survival uh, for those patients is around 65%. So 35% of patients on total artificial heart die uh, after one year. And this is in high volume centers. In small volume centers that per performing less than 10, the one year survival is only 35%. Because most of these patients are keeping for with, you, you put total artificial heart with patients with biventricular failure, severe right ventricular failure that are not candidate for VADs, and really managing those patients is not easy. But the question is when to refer patients to advanced heart failure care and advanced, advanced heart failure clinic. The guidelines say that if the patient, definitely he should have very, uh, he had a little bit 
long uh, life expectancy does not have poor uh, malignancy or very poor life expectancy. If he's class three or four, despite medical therapy, including uh, CRT and ICD, so this patient definitely should be referred for advanced heart failure care. If he's class two, so he should have one high risk criteria. The high risk criteria, which is repeated hospitalization, prior inotropic support, um, severely reduced ejection fraction, ejection fraction less than 20%, worsening RV function, worsening and prog progressive uh, failure of end organ damage, renal or um, liver uh, dysfunction, or if there is uh, hypotension with repeated uh, episodes of hypoperfusion. Uh, but importantly, that we the Intermax registry have proposed seven profiles. There are seven Intermax profiles have been proposed to classify patients who are potential candidate for advanced care or ventricular assist device into seven profiles. To make it simple, the first three profiles are patients or inotropes. Intermax profile one, patients or inotropes and crashing. Profile two, patients on inotropes, but he's progressively deteriorating. Third one, the third profile on any tropes, but is stable. But once you try to withdraw any tropes, the patient collapses and you need to reintroduce any tropes. But once he's in tropes, he's stable. So the first three profiles, patients are any tropes. The other four patients are, are uh, on uh, regular uh, medications. Profile four, patients frequent flyer, has history of repeated hospitalization. Actually, every time he's admitted to the hospital. Profile five, who is He's good at rest, but he couldn't do any activity. Uh, and uh, profile six, the patients just if he do, he, he can do some activities, but he 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 feel uh, effort intolerance and he couldn't uh, perform. And profile seven, which is a classic NIA class three. What do the guidelines say? In patients with intermax one and two, those who are crashing or in a tropes or progressively deteriorating in a tropes, it's not recommended to put a long-term support. You put a short-term mechanical support like ECMO, like any short-term mechanical support and see uh, whether the cardiac function will recover or not, the neurological outcome and the renal and uh, liver function. If the liver, if the cardiac function improved, so the patient, you can wean it from the short-term support and continue in medical treatment. But if the neurological outcome, the patient has poor neurological outcome and didn't improve, so you can actually wean support and don't offer him any long-term support. But if the, the cardiac function did not recover and his good neurological outcome and improving renal and, uh, and liver function and the organ function on short-term support, this patient can be referred for a long-term support. And this is because... If you look at the data from the Intermax, there is a trend toward now doing low, less patients in Intermax profile one and two because they have high in-hospital mortality. 30% of patients die in hospital. So you put the long-term VADs with the expensive and the whole program and the patient die before even discharge. And even after discharge, you have a higher uh, mortality. And now there is a trend toward doing more patients and instead in class three and four, and this is what do the guidelines recommend that in Intermax three to four, without, um, uh, with, uh, if, if, they have, if they have contraindication to heart transplantation, like uh, as we know, uh, infection, uh, patients with malignancy, irreversible liver dysfunction, if you have a contraindication to transplantation or if the transplantation is not available, so this patient will benefit from long-term mechanical uh, support. And in Intermax, four, page, more than four, so patients who are stable in the, uh, I, as I previously mentioned, if he has some high risk features, so this patient also can be referred for long-term mechanical support as recurrent hospitalization, progressive end organ failure, inability to perform actually uh, cardiopulmonary exercise because of effort intolerance, or if you did the cardiopulmonary exercise, uh, you find the peak exercise oxygen capacity less than 12. And as we know, VADs are a sick group of patients. Uh, they have uh, the procedure actually associated with high mortality. There is cost and many adverse events. We know that once you put VAD and you unload the left ventricle, it improves the cardiac output, it improves the systemic venous return. So it can unmask right ventricle, subtle or subclinical RV dysfunction, and the patient complained from RV failure after LVADs. So that's why patients with significant RV dysfunction may benefit from total artificial heart rather than VADs. In addition, you give an anticoagulation, so you have the problem of bleeding and uh, pump dysfunction due to thrombosis and thromboembolic 
manifestations that are associated with significantly higher rate of infection. The, the, the freedom from infection actually at two years is only 40%. So there is inf infection will happen. It, it needs very good care. Infection can happen, but importantly, you should early detect it in order to avoid uh, reaching the device and reach to a catastrophic device infection that needs explantation and exchanging this pump. But really, the adverse events, all the side effects and adverse events significantly improve now with the new generation of VATS compared to the old, uh, the new continuous flow compared to the old pulsatile uh, flow pumps. So finally, in patients with advanced heart failure, importantly, we should properly identify uh, and define your patient that he has advanced heart failure. Heart transplantation is the gold standard, but it's not available in our country and, and, and actually due to donor shortage, it's not available for all patients. Third generation vests now are a reliable option for those patients that lead to significant improvement in survival. And definitely till now, the benefits of these vets outweigh the risk despite that they have risk and adverse events, but they have a significant survival benefits. We have still the problem of the right ventricle, the RV support. That's why total artificial heart can help. However, also it's associated with, it does not have uh, significantly uh, improved survival uh, in those patients. And in the future, maybe with solving the problem of cable and having transcutaneous energy transport, so we can transfer the energy transcutaneously to the pump without having cable, may decrease more and more the side effects of these fads and improve the outcome of such patients. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mohammed, for this very nice talk. And I just like best on anticoagulation. Which anticoagulant for the LVAT patients? Warfarin. Warfarin. We know in prosthetic valves, the data on uh, NOAX. Never tried the NOAX? Never, never. It is much, much in, more risky than prosthetic valves because uh, small thrombus can lead to dysfunction. And once dysfunction happens, so the patient will collapse or you need an explantation. Second, uh, thromboembolism because <clears throat> there is some sluggish. So any thrombus can lead to stroke. So warfarin is the recommended the target INR. Target INR high, more than three, three to three point five. In addition to aspirin, aspirin has been identified as a predictor of survival in those patients. So you put aspirin and warfarin. Thank you, Mohammed Bahaniq, the hiya as usual. We are the name we are going to give you. We are going to give you that we have the first, the second, and the third. All of them are going to be in the heart failure program. يبقوا حاجة على مستوى المنطقة العربية محمد وانا عارف ان انت في أسوان كنت شاركت كتير في الموضوع ده هو انت ستيل بتعتقد ان الالفاد هيبقى لي بوتنشال رول ان ذا فيوتشر مع وجود الساتش مجموعة من الميديكيشنز اللي هي بتقلل هارت فيلر وسبتلايزيشن وبتقلل السيرفايفل ولا نتجه الهارت ترانسبلانتيشن ونحاول ان احنا كبوليسي للدولة المصرية إن إحنا ننفست في أكثر ده سؤال لا طبعا لو إحنا هنتكلم in our country we need to invest on the pharmacological therapy لأن ده هيحسن ال quality of life for survival بكوست أقل وكمان إحنا بنتكلم إنه yes this these drugs will improve the survival but some of our some of these patients will progress to a stage of advanced heart failure VADS it's uh, the program is a sophisticated program but Hey, uh, worldwide, it is now uh, many, many centers of VADS doing VADS as an easy uh, procedure. Uh, the outcome is really good, even with old patients with comorbidities. Uh, definitely, in our country, it's better to invest on pharmacological therapy. And the second step is mechanical therapy. The project pump can it at least million Yes, yes, maybe more. وهي المشكلة مش في البامب بس لأن البيشنس دول محتاجين very good support بعد كده سواء كان هم يأخذوا الميديكيشنز very good follow up البروجرام نفسه is costly لكن يعني when you come to a patient who has who has symptoms and poor survival despite of pharmacological therapy وحياة البيشنس بيعيشوا يعني حياتهم يعني as if he is normal 
uh, I have, I'm, I'm following actually a dentist and uh, and even ممكن ما حدش يعرف هو مركب بات لان there is some new technologies that might keep it uh, بشكل ما يبانش uh, خالص ان هو مركب uh, بات يعني ف the number of patients I think they, they did it more than 40 patients uh, survival is really good the data are comparable to the international standard but uh, هي الباد بروجرام في اسوان كان ليميتد برضه لليونج بيشنتس نتيجه الكوست وكده لليونج بيشنتس هي وورلد وايد نو الفاتس از افيلبل فور اول يونج اند ايلدرلي بيشنتس اول بيشنتس ريسيفينج فات بيكوز ترانسبلانت وي ريتش ذا سيلينج هو مش مش هيزيد اكتر من كده الترانسبلانت بس ذا فاتس كان انكريز بشكل السيرفايفل بينيفيت بتاعته كومباريبل بترانسبلانتيشن قريب قوي يعني مثلا الون يير سرفايفل بعد ترانسبلانتيشن 90% الون يير سرفايفل بعد فات نير 80% الفايف يير سرفايفل يعني ترانسبلانت حوالي 70% هي برضه يعني بنتكلم ان التو يير سرفايفل بعد فات وصل دلوقتي 70% هو اكيد اقل شويه من الترانسبلانت بس بدا يتحسن كتير واي ثينك مع نيو تكنولوجيز هيبدا يقرب كتير للترانسبلانت لان احنا عارفين برضه هو الفات عنده مشاكل وادفيرس ايفنتس بس برضه ترانسبلانت في ايمينو سبريسس وبروجرام ولازم عنده مايكارديال بايوبسي اتس اولسو اتس اتس بروجرام يعني برضه في ميني تشالنجز في الفولو اب. ثانك يو محمد. احنا ممكن نجو تو ذا ثيرد سيشن عشان بس الوقت لان لسه عندنا ثلاث محاضرات دكتور ايمانويل فيري انتريستنج ليكشر باي بروفيسور ايمانويل Prevention of sudden death and heart failure, using drugs. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, elegant uh, conference. Mahadra uh, is preventing sudden death in heart failure, role of uh, pharmacological uh, therapy. Uh, what causes sudden death in patients with uh, chronic heart failure? Sudden death characterizes the mode of demise in 30 to 50% of patients with chronic heart failure and the reduced ejection fraction. Occasionally, uh, these events have an identifiable uh, pathophysiological trigger like a myocardial infarction, a catecholamine surge, or electrolyte imbalance, but in most circumstances, there is no acute precipitating mechanism. Uh, uh, most of the patients who present with sudden death, we can identify a cause, like and sometimes we cannot. Uh, why does this happen? Uh, there is a, uh, a physics uh, concept, it's more the concept of self-organizing criticality and cascading failure. Self-organizing criticality is a property of complex systems in which small events trigger major changes due to subtle interdependencies between elements. However, the stability of the self-organizing process to maintain stability is limited. Uh, an example to this is the addition of sand grains uh, to a pile of sand. So the slope increases until it reaches a critical slope after which an avalanche occurs and the slope decreases again. Uh, once the limit is breached, the extreme interdependence leads to a cascading failure where the tiny fault of one part immediately triggers the failure of other components. When the first part fails, other elements that would normally compensate for the failed component are unduly stressed. The resulting overload causes these to collapse as well, prompting a rapidly evolving cascade of failure. Uh, slowly progressive processes can and typically do end suddenly in the absence of an acute precipitating event. اللي هي بالعربي كده آه لو جبنا القشه التي قصمت ظهر البيت. Yes. 
self-organizing criticality and cascading failure in the failing ventricle. Uh, the process of remodeling is characterized by the slow loss of cardiomyocytes, progressive stretch on the wall of the ventricular chamber, and the gradual accumulation of myocardial fibrosis. Uh, the cascade of heart failure remodeling involves activation of endogenous neurohormonal systems, uh, the norepinephrine, angiotensin II, aldosterone, and neprilicine, action potential prolongation, alterations in calcium homeostasis, and abnormal conduction. This creates an exceptionally fragile and vulnerable substrate in which complex adaptations to progressive cardiomyocyte stress and stretch can come to an abrupt end, leading to acute circulatory collapse that manifests either electrically, uh, as in ventricular tachyarrhythmias, mechanically, like asystole, bradyarrhythmia, or pulseless electrical activity, or incessant ventricular tachyarrhythmias that persist despite repetitive ICD discharges. Because these rhythms are dissociated from mechanical activity, uh, the lethal consequences of mechanical failure cannot uh, be prevented by an ICD. Uh, sudden cardiac death results from the cascade of upstream events that create an electrically or mechanically unstable heart. And interest interestingly, it is the non-arrhythmic drugs that are probably acting on those upstream events which have been shown effective for prevention of sudden death. The manner in uh, most patients who present with sudden death, half of them are even uh, present with sudden death due to the tachyarrhythmia like an another half present with uh, asystole or pulseless electrical activity or acute mechanical failure. And uh, this subcategory of patients cannot be uh, saved by an ICD. Uh, what kind of medications would save them? These are the medications who prevent, uh, which prevent uh, the, the failure from the start, as I will show in the next slides. These drugs include potential roles for neurohormonal antagonists like beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, neprilicine inhibitors, uh, sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitors, and antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, on the left side of the screen, we have precipitating factors uh, like a myocardial infarction, the catecholamine surge, the electrolyte imbalance, and can lead uh, to ventricular tachyarrhythmias. And uh, these uh, factors can be prevented like by revascularization or by medications. Uh, on the right side of the uh, screen, uh, we have adverse left ventricular remodeling with self-organizing uh, criticality and the cascading failure that can be electrical or uh, mechanical, resulting in uh, radiarrhythmias, electromechanical dissociation, or assist. Uh, I'll start with the inhibitors of the RAN angiotensin <coughs> systems. Uh, in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, uh, not treated with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors primarily act to prevent pump failure deaths and heart failure hospitalizations. The effect of these drugs on the risk of sudden death is modest, less than 10%, and in direct comparator trials, the benefit is smaller than with beta blockers. Uh, what about beta blockers? They reduce the risk of sudden death by 35 to 50% in patients with uh, New York Heart class 2, 3, and 4 symptoms. Uh, who have a reduced ejection fraction, who are already receiving ACE inhibitors, but do not have an ICD. Uh, this favorable effect is likely related to uh, an action to minimize the consequences of catecholamine surges, the prevention of new myocardial infarctions in patients with underlying ischemic cardiomyopathy, and reversal of cardiac remodeling and minimizing the development of vulnerable substrate that is uh, known as it's prone to electrical instability. Uh, with that, uh, that was uh, evident in uh, all the heart failure trials with uh, beta blockers, like in the Copernicus trial, uh, sudden death was significantly lower in the group treated with carvedilol than the placebo group. Uh, in the Cybus 3 trial, uh, uh, patients who were treated with bisoprolol had significantly lower uh, incidence of sudden death than those uh, who were treated with uh, uh, placebo. And in the merit HF trial, there are fewer, uh, fewer sudden deaths in the metoprolol group than in the placebo group, as well as deaths from worsening heart failure. Uh, from a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, beta blockers were effective in the prevention of sudden uh, cardiac deaths with an odds ratio of uh, 0.69, and that was highly significant. 
mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, uh, spironolactone and eplerinone reduce the risk of sudden death, both in patients with chronic heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, as well as post-myocardial patients. Uh, the benefits is largely seen uh, in those who are receiving concomitant therapy with its inhibitors and beta blockers. Uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists reduce the risk of sudden death by 35% in patients receiving beta blocker, but they have negligible effects in those not treated with beta blockers. Uh, the synergism uh, of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists with beta blockers may be related to the fact that the two classes of drugs act on different uh, proarrhythmic mechanisms and different aspects of ventricular structure. Specifically, beta blockers blunt catecholamine surges and reduce cardiac volumes, whereas aldosterone antagonists prevent hypokalemia and minimize fibrosis with little effect on ventricular geometry. Uh, in a meta analysis of uh, the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist trials uh, in patients with heart failure, uh, showed that in all trials, the rails, the emphasis, the emphasis, and overall, there were fewer uh, sudden cardiac deaths in patients treated with a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist than those who were not. Uh, what about the neprilysine inhibitor? Uh, the addition of a neprilysine inhibitor to uh, an ARB uh, uh, potentiates the effect of the later on ventricular remodeling. Uh, although conventional inhibitors of the renin angiotensin system have only a modest effect to prevent sudden, de uh, sudden death, the combination cyclobutyl valzartan provides an incremental 20% decrease in the risk of sudden death in patients already receiving an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, and a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. And that's from uh, the Paradigm HF trial uh, showing uh, a comparison regarding the sudden cardiac deaths. Uh, when comparing uh, the uh, LCZ, uh, the cyclobutyl uh, valsartan compared with NRP alone, there was marked reduction and the hazard ratio was 0 0.8 and that was significant. Uh, what about the SGLT2 inhibitors? Uh, I didn't find a lot of studies uh, showing the effect of SG, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in patients uh, in, on the effect of sudden death in heart failure. However, there was this study uh, that uh, compared uh, the incidence of arrhythmia in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus or heart failure. Uh, except for one study of heart failure, all patients had uh, type 2 as a follow-up range from 24 weeks to uh, about six years. Uh, the SGLT2 therapy was associated with a significant reduction uh, in the risk of atrial arrhythmia, and the sudden cardiac death component uh, was uh, significantly lower in those treated with SGLT2 inhibitors. So uh, what's the overall effect of neurohormonal antagonists? If we have a hypothetical cohort of 1,000 patients with chronic heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, without therapy, uh, 400 patients would be expected to die suddenly in the absence of modern-day treatment with neurohormonal antagonists. If uh, these patients receive a beta blocker alone, uh, in addition to the ACE inhibitor, uh, we would expect to see a reduction in the risk of sudden cardiac death by about 40%, i.e. 240 patients would die suddenly instead of the 400. With the addition of mineralocorticoid receptor uh, uh, antagonists, the risk of uh, sudden cardiac death would decrease by an additional 35 percent. Uh, only 156 patients would die. If we add an aprilisine inhibitor, uh, the risk of death would re uh, be reduced by an additional 20 percent. About 125 patients would die. Therefore, uh, in a modern day, target dose combination of neurohormonal antagonists administered to 1,000 patients would be expected to prevent 275 sudden deaths, and also original 400 events decreased to 120 events. And these drugs would also produce favorable effects on pump failure deaths, as well as hospitalizations for worsening heart failure. By contrast, as a placement of an ICD administered to 1,000 patients would be expected to prevent uh, 240 to 180 deaths, 400 deaths decreased to 120 or 160 events, but without any effect on events related to worsening heart failure. Uh, is there a role for uh, antiarrhythmic uh, agents? Amiodarone is the only antiarrhythmic agent uh, that has shown an effect on uh, 
mortality, uh, sudden cardiac death to be specific in patients with uh, heart failure. Uh, it reduced the incidence of sudden cardiac death. It reduced cardiovascular death. However, uh, there was a 1.5% uh, absolute risk reduction that did not meet statistical significance. And the possible explanation is that uh, amiodarone toxicity happens in all patients after long-term use, uh, especially the pulmonary and thyroid toxicity. Uh, what about other antiarrhythmic drugs? Uh, the class one antiarrhythmic drugs were uh, studied in the CAS trial, which compared the efficacy of three class one antiarrhythmic drugs with placebo in post myocardial infarction patients uh, who have asymptomatic or mildly asymptomatic PVCs. And the antiarrhythmic drug treatment was associated with an increase in both arrhythmic and non arrhythmic deaths. In the CAS trial that evaluated uh, antiarrhythmic drug. Uh, propafenone versus medical therapy in the prevention of sudden death. Propafenone was discontinued after an interim analysis showed a 61 higher all cause mortality rate. So, the take home messages pharmacological therapy remains the cornerstone in the management of patients with heart failure. Uh, the magnitude of cumulative benefit of the combination of neurohormonal antagonists uh, on sudden cardiac death is meaningful and rivals that of an ICD. And ideally, patients should receive all appropriate drug and device treatments used in conjunction with each other. Thank you very much. I, I have a small question, sure. a short question, Manuel. Thank you very much for the... Elegant presentation. What are the predictors of sudden death? Do we need uh, to risk stratify patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction to uh, CMR, for example, looking for myocardial fibrosis uh, before considering? which patients who should be subjected to device therapy? So far, only the ejection fraction is the only criterion used for selection of patients for an ICD. Uh, and it has proven, you know, a lot of other uh, parameters have been studied, uh, and the mass and signal average ECG, and uh, pulse, uh, heart rate variability, like in COLA didn't, uh, help us in choosing which patients to put an ICD in. So uh, only the ejection fraction is the only criteria that we have. Um, we know that the presence of uh, scars, uh, which are substrate for ventricular arrhythmia, uh, increase uh, the selectivity of patients that we put an ICD for, especially in patients who have dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, those who have scars, benefit more from an ICD than those who don't. Uh, the MRI will have uh, a role in, in the future, like in right now on this ejection fraction. Emmanuel, uh, thank you, as yeah. usual. Uh, a very outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to add to the role of ICD, who uh, downgraded the uh, recent guidelines on the way that we are present الأربعة الكبار وهم لهم أنتي أريزميك إفكت فحصل داون جريدينج للآي سي دي هل تعتقد أنها يحصل فيرد داون جريدينج إن ذا فيوتشر؟ الآي سي دي واز داون جريدد في البيشنس ويز دايليتد كارديو مايوبس نوت إن بيشنس ويز إسكيميك كارديو مايوبس and the reason for this downgrade was a Danish trial uh, uh, in it, you know, uh, there was no significant difference after uh, a long-term follow-up in patients who have dilated cardiomyopathy, except in younger patients. Uh, the, the way by which the, the, the nice medications that we have now uh, reduce mortality is by improving the ejection fraction. So I guess the question would be how far we will wait uh, on optimum medical therapy to see uh, if the ejection fraction improves or not. If the ejection fraction, and this can take three months or six months or even uh, longer, uh, but still the ejection fraction would be 
the, the cutoff where we choose patients for ICD. Manual here, مش بتمنع بس عن طريق improving ejection fraction. هي لها anti arrhythmic effect. حتى المجموعة الجديدة الإمبا والدابا لها anti ventricular tachycardia و anti ventricular و anti atrial flutter و anti مش كده؟ Yes. و البيتا بلوكر زي ما أنت يعني مش 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 بس عن طريق improving ejection fraction. I'm I'm talking about the guidelines and patient selection. Thank you. Thank you very much. أنا عايز أنتهز فرصة إن إحنا كلنا متجمعين النهاردة وأدعو أساتذة الاسم للوقوف بجواري على المنصة دكتور وفاء دكتور سامح دكتور محمد الجملي دكتور هشام صلاح إحنا في الأيام اللي فاتت الحقيقة كان في تشالنج كبير جدا للديبارتمنت عندنا كان عندنا انتخابات صعبه جدا الانتخابات دي ليها اهميه لان جمعيه القلب المصريه دي من اكبر الجمعيات في الميدل ايست ومهم قوي ان احنا نبقى ممثلين بالمناسبه اسم القلب القصر العيني مش من التجمعات الكبيره احنا على مستوى مصر احنا اسم صغير لا يقارن بمعهد القلب او بعين شمس او بالتجمعات في الجامعات الاقليميه ومع ذلك ومع ذلك قدرنا ان احنا نحصل على منصبين في وسط ال15 في وسط جمعيه القلب المصريه النهارده انا بنتهز الفرصه عشان اكرم اصحاب المنصب دول انا عايز يعني احيي كمان افراد الاسم بتوعي ان هم وقفوا جنب مرشحينهم فوجودكم وتكتلنا ورا بعض في ان احنا نطلع ببعض ممثلينا في الجمعيه دول بحاجه مهمه جدا بيقوي روح الانتماء ودي اللي احنا حريصين عليها في كل الاجيال اسمحوا لي كمان ان انا ادعو الدكتوره مروه مشعل نائب مدير مستشفيات جامعه القاهره ممثله عن مستشفى جامعة القاهرة إنها تنضم إلي في حفل التكريم المكرم الأول أستاذ الدكتور مجدي عبد الحميد المكرم الثاني الاستاذ الدكتور عز فرج طبعا انا زي ما قلت في الانترودكشن الصبح طبعا يعني وشكرت طبعا استاذ الدكتور محمد عبد الغني وكل طبعا اساتذتي واساتذه الاسم وكل اعضاء الاسم ده مش غريب طبعا على اسم القلب انه دايما بيقف بجانب كل يعني الاستاف او كل اعضاء الاسم في اي انتخابات والحقيقه انا بشكركم جميعا طبعا على الدعم الكبير لكل الاسم وطبعا دكتور محمد عبد الغني وكل الاساتذه كان ليهم دور كبير جدا في الدعوه لوقوف كل اعضاء الاسم في الانتخابات والحمد لله طبعا احنا اي حد بينجح في الاسم هو عباره عن يعني نجاح لاسم القلب مش نجاح لاشخاص ان احنا يبقى عندنا اثنين ممثلين في جمعيه القلب المصريه في مجلس اداري حاجه نجاح لاسم القلب كله 
فالنجاح لنا جميعا طبعا بشكر حضراتكم النهارده على الحضور وعلى تكريم الحياه دكتور محمد عمل لنا مفاجاه يعني جميله وده مش طبعا مش غريب على اخويا وصديقي العزيز دكتور محمد عبد الغني طبعا استاذ الدكتور هشام صلاح واستاذ الدكتور محمد الرملي استاذ الدكتور وفاء العروسي واستاذ الدكتور مروه مشعل كل استاذ الدكتور سامح بخوم وطبعا بقى المفاجاه الجميله وجود طبعا يعني اختي العزيزه استاذ الدكتور عزه فراج وبعتبر يعني نجاحها وانضمامها لمجلس اداره جامعه الاهلي المصريه يعني اضافه قويه وحاجه يعني كل الناس الحقيقه فرحانه وسعيده بانضمام الدكتور عزه لانه عارفين قد ايه الدكتور عزه طبعا قيمه علميه واضافه لاي مجموعه يعني مجلس اداره الجامعه العربيه المصريه ان شاء الله في الاربع سنين دول هيبقى ليها ان شاء الله كونتريبيوشن كبير زي ما احنا متوقعين للدكتور عزه دايما اشكركم شكرا جزيلا آه انا بس طبعا مش هزود كتير على اللي قاله الدكتور مجدي بس عايزه فعلا اشكركم جميعا بدايه من الدكتور محمد عبد الغني رئيس اسم القلب اللي عمل المفاجاه الحلوه دي وطبعا كل زملائي هبتدي يمكن بالدكتور مجدي صاحب الاختيار ان انا ابقى في المرشحين في الجمعيه ويمكن انا يمكن اكثر من مره ترددت لكن في الاخر يعني استسلمت كوني في الجمعية دلوقتي هو بفضلكم أنا مش هنسى للدكتور هشام صلاح عمله بعد ما جمع كل الناس وكان متواجد بنفسه في يوم الانتخابات ومن أول اليوم لآخر اليوم تقريبا كل زمايلي حتى اللي ما قدرش يجي أنا كلمتهم تقريبا واحد واحد اللي قدر يجي كنت مبسوطة قوي إن هو فعلا ما قصرش واللي ما قدرش يجي بعد توكيلات أنا كلمت تقريبا حتى كل زمايلنا اللي مسافرين ان لازم يبعتوا توكيلات علشان الخمسه بتوع الاسم ومعاهم الدكتور هيثم سليمان يكونوا مرشحين منتخبين في المجموعه دي يمكن بعد الانتخابات ما خلصت ورسيت طبعا الدكتور مجدي محلق دي مش محتاجه يعني اسئله يمكن كان الوضع اكتر مع لسه الاول مره او الصغيرين المدرسين والدكتور الدكتور كريم والدكتور هيثم لكن اللي اقصده ان احنا عايزين بس نريالايز ان تجمعنا بيفرق كتير قوي وان لما الناس تهتم ان يبقى ليها ممثل في مكان دي حاجة حلوة قوي. اخر حاجة خالص انا عايزة اشكر زملائي اللي انا يعني انا بحب الكل الحمد لله بس اللي فعلا كان حريص جدا رغم شغله ورغم مسؤولياته ان يجي الدكتورة مروة مشعل انا عارفة قد ايه هي مشغولة في اللي هي فيه لكن كانت حريصة انها تبقى موجودة الدكتورة داليا راميسي كانت واقفة معايا تقريبا من الساعة 11 لحد الساعة 4 متواجدة تقول للناس آه، القصر العيني موجود وانتخبوا الناس. آه، حابه قوي اشكر كل الدكتوره نهى كانت موجوده برضو من اول يوم كانت جايه مع بنتها فيعني اقصد ان احنا لو حسينا بمسؤوليه صغيره ان وجودنا مهم في جمعيه القلب احنا هننجح وبدل ما هنبقى اثنين هنبقى اربعه وممكن نبقى اكثر كمان. شكرا جزيلا. آه، انا طبعا انا عايز ابارك لدكتور مجدي ودكتوره عزه على النجاح الرائع. والحقيقه اهم حاجه عندي هي الروح الحلوه الموجوده الحقيقه احنا دخل من الاسم ستة ووفق منهم اثنين وانا شايف حتى الـ الـ الاربعه الفاضلين وفقوا برضو ليه لان هم الحقيقه برضو الروح الجميله اللي بينشروها والقيمه الجميله اللي هم ضايفينها برضو حاجه في منتهى الجمال انا بحب احيي الاسم كله على وقوفه مع اعضاء الاسم اللي داخلين في الانتخابات المره اللي فاتت وبشكر دكتور محمد على اللفته الظريفه دي الحقيقه هو كلمني من يومين وقال لي ان انا يعني عايزني ابقى متواجد عشان التكريم الحقيقه اتبسطت جدا وانا بشكرك كمان مره شكرا جزيلا. انا عايز كمان احيي الحقيقه المهندس طارق زوج دكتور عزه فجاج المهندس طارق الحقيقه هو طبعا واقف جنبها واقف جنبها في الانتخابات من اول يوم وانا شايفه كان متواجد في جميع ايام المؤتمر وجميع الجلسات العلميه فاحنا بنحيي حضرتك كمان المهندس طارق الحقيقه تطوع مشكورا ان هو هيتولى تجهيز وحده الموجات فوق الصوتيه اللي هي اسمها حاليا فوكس 
الوحده دي ان شاء الله هنستلمها وهنفتتحها بعد العيد وهتبقى نقله كبيره جدا كل النون انفيزف لاب بتاعنا هيبقى على احلى مستوى بعد ما المهندس طارق السيد الفون شكرا جدا شكرا ناوي هنستأنف بقى الجلسات بتاعتنا ادعو الاخ العزيز الاستاذ الدكتور احمد ضماطي احد المحاضرين العمالقه في المنطقه بتاعتنا دكتور احمد احنا كلنا اذان صغير لمحاضرتك اهلا بك مساء الخير جميعا الف مبروك لاساتذتنا الاعزاء وانا سعيد ان انا ابقى مشارك في يوم العلمي للاسم وان شاء الله هكلم حضراتكم النهارده على prevention of sudden cardiac death in heart failure patients particularly about device therapy. I am sure ان احنا we covered the interventions that are known to prevent sudden cardiac death in this patient population including medical therapy and my talk will focus uh, on the uh, ICD with CRT uh, and the role in prevention of sudden cardiac death in this patient population. And um, I'll, I'll go straight ahead to the, to the core of the presentation. And to do this, I will divide the patient population into two groups. So ischemic cardiomyopathy patients and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. And talking about ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, um, we will talk about where are we in terms of the guidelines and uh, where how did we get here and where are we heading so in terms of the guidelines there is sort of a consensus between the american and the european guidelines in terms of the indications of icd in patients with uh, heart failure so those patients who are indicated are patients with uh, NYHA class one with an ejection fraction that is less than 30. Those patients with an NYHA class two or three with an ejection fraction less than 35. And uh, those patients who are uh, having an ejection fraction that is less than 40, but they get non-sustained VT and you manage somehow to get them to the EP lab and get a sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. So these are the three main populations that qualifies with a class one indication for an ICD. So the studies that paved the road for these recommendations are important time-honored studies, the MEDIT-1, the MUST, and the MEDIT-2 trials. And um, despite the fact that they are uh, old studies, they are very important. We need to remind each other with that uh, every now and then. So uh, the MEDIT study um, was targeting patients with an impaired ejection fraction post-MI who had some markers of arrhythmogenicity. So they had frequent PVCs or they had non-sustained VT. And those patients were um, subject to an EP study. And um, whenever the EP study was non-suppressible with anti-arrhythmic drugs, they were randomized to defibrillators versus no defibrillators, so conventional drug therapy. And in this patient population, uh, we ended up with a relative risk reduction of overall mortality in the limb who had defibrillators. A similar study, yet a bit different in the design, is the MUST study. It was originally uh, randomized to sort out whether patients who get induced VT in the EP lab that is suppressed with medications, are they better off with this medication or are they better off without a medication? And although the primary endpoint was non-significant, but the patients who had uh, VT that was inducible and was not suppressed by antiarrhythmic medications ended up receiving an ICD. And the important observation in this study was that uh, these patients are the only patients who did well in terms of overall mortality. So they had significant reduction in the overall mortality. The last stage that paved this road was the MEDIT-2 study. The MEDIT-2 study was unique because of the fact that 
it did not care about whether there is a marker of arismogeneity or not. So all patients who had an impaired ejection fraction post MI after a certain duration of time, which was 40 days, were randomized to either conventional therapy or a defibrillator. And it turned out that these patients as well did better in terms of mortality. So these are the three studies that showed a relative risk reduction with defibrillator of 54% of overall mortality in the MADIT, 51% in the MUST, and 31% in the MADIT 2. And this led to the current guidelines which recommend implanting ICD for all patients with impaired ejection fraction that are, who are post-MI. So where are we heading? The current dogma is that we do not put ICDs early on in the course of coronary artery disease. So if a patient gets a myocardial infarction or had a revascularization done, you need to wait 40 days post-MI or, or three months post-revascularization to have a benefit from an ICD. And that was based on studies like the dynamite studies and the cabbage patch study. In this study, the DABA study, we looked at implanting ICD a little bit early on in the course of the disease. So post-MI patients, 30 to 60 days post-MI. But these patients had, had to be high-risk patients. So they are either patients presenting with extensive anterior myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, or a high Kilip class. And when the ICDs were put early on in the course of the, of the disease in this group of patients, they had a, a decrease in the all-cause mortality at three years. So instead of 35% in the conventional therapy group, they had 24% uh, mortality in the uh, defibrillator group. So that tells you that down the road, the dogma of not implanting an ICD in the high-risk category patients early on post-MI might change in the near future. How about non-ischemic cardiomyopathy? Where are we? How did we reach here? And where are we headed? So the dogma is pretty much uh, ICD is indicated for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients as it is for ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. So whenever a patient has an NYH cl class of two or three and an impaired ejection fraction that is less than 35%, and on guideline recommended medical therapy, he still qualifies for an ICD. So how did we get here? So many studies, including the KRHF study, the companion study, but an important seminal study was the SCUD-HIFT study. So the SCUD-HIFT study enrolled about 2,500 patients or so. So these were randomized to placebo, so conventional therapy, a muterone, or an ICD. And there was no difference in overall mortality when the group who had conventional therapy, namely ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and amuterone. But there was a significant mortality reduction when we looked at patients who had an ICD implantation. So this tells you that people with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy would benefit as well from an ICD as ischemic cardiomyopathy. So is this dogma going to change? So there are certain data that was published in the last few years that challenges this paradigm. So the important study is the Danish study. So in the Danish study, this was a, high, a, a group of patients who uh, were randomized to a control therapy, so conventional therapy, and an ICD. But those patients, most of them would have a CRT as well on board. And it was found that the ICD did not add much of a benefit in the overall analysis, which was the primary endpoint in terms of mortality reduction and heart failure hospitalization. So this is one study that might change the current dogma. In this meta-analysis as well, that studies several studies, some of them were uh, CRT patients, some of them were not. We if we have a close look at the overall analysis of this mortality, we find that the relative risk reduction was 0.74 and the confidence interval crossed the moiety with no statistical significance, indicating that this meta-analysis does not favor 
the implantation of a CRT defibrillator over in patients who have a CRT pacemaker uh, on, on their own. So in, in the overall population, putting an ICD uh, in the patients who have a CRT implant on board who is non-ischemic might not add an extra benefit in terms of prevention of sudden cardiac death. Um, there was an important question before I, I started. Uh, is there a change for the guidelines in terms with the, uh, of the new medications, uh, um, namely the secretary valsartan and the, uh, the, the imbagliflozin and so forth. So up till now, there is no change in the guidelines. So uh, ICDs and CRTs still have the same indication, but with the improvement in the ejection fraction and the symptoms of heart failure within these patients, again, down the road, this dogma might change. So where should we be heading? Uh, in the community registries, um, there are several studies that demonstrated that a significant group of non-survivors of, non of sudden cardiac deaths have an ejection fraction that is less, that is more than 40%. And that uh, those group of patients with the current indications and the guideline does not, do not qualify for an ICD. So being having an ejection fraction as the sole marker of risk of sudden cardiac death is not good enough. So you, you might be skipping patients who will die suddenly and you not put ICD and you do not put ICD for them. Only on the other hand, only three, 35% of patients who are eligible for a primary prevention indication for an ICD. So they do have a primary prevention indication. You put them the ICD and they never use it. So that tells you that the other way around is crude as well, and we do not scrutinize our patient properly till now. Considering these limitations, we need to look at more risk markers for the prediction of sudden cardiac death to improve the patient selection, to be able to sort out the patient who will really benefit regardless his ejection fraction. So the take home messages of this presentation is that the standard of care right now remains to be that an ICD is indicated for symptomatic patients with an impaired ejection fraction, regardless the etiology. Recent data suggests that earlier um, implantation in ischemic cardiomyopathy patients may be beneficial. Among CRT patients in the non-ischemic population, recent data suggests that there is a less added survival benefit except in a small group of patients, sub-analysis, which were, were, who were the younger patients. So these patients might not benefit from an add-on ICD to the already implanted CRT. We need to look for accurate risk markers for the prediction of sudden cardiac death to improve patient selection and to be able to put the prophylactic ICD in the patients who will need it. And with that, I conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ahmed. State of art. State of art and this state of art. And I saw Ali Leek, the current practice in Egypt. Definitely, we are not, we are not following the guidelines. And then a financial barrier. And I'm sure there are for ICD, the Lyonin indicated according to guidelines. Hell, hell, our local. Uh, guidelines in Egypt. هل إحنا عندنا data إن إحنا نعمل كده؟ أنت رأيك إيه؟ وإيه اللي بيحصل فعلاً هنا في مصر؟ شكراً دكتور محمد السؤال المهم أوي. هو إحنا خلينا نفصل ما بين private practice و public practice. The private practice is based on a discussion with the patient, with the risk and benefit, and we offer ICD as per the current universal indications, and the patient knows his pros and cons and he, and he go for the procedure or not, that's his decision. And that, so that's an individualized approach. About the public practice, I wouldn't think it would be reasonable to formulate written guidelines that is sort of contradictory to the, you know, the universal agreed upon guidelines. But in practice, given the limited resources what happens really uh, on, in, in real life is that we prioritize patients who have a secondary prevention indication. And 
the next category of patients are patients who are um, indicated, but they are young. And we refrain from putting devices in patients who are old in age, particularly if they have non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. لان احنا عندنا سوليد داتا تقول ان الاسكيميك كارديومايوباثي وود بينيفيت اف هي هاز ان امبير ديجكشن فراكشن ايفن اف اتس برايمري بريفنشن انما رايت ناو ذا داتا از فيج ان تيرمز اوف اولدر بوبيوليشن اند نون اسكيميك كارديومايوباثي يونج بيشنتس دايليتد كارديومايوباثي ديجكشن فراكشن ريديوسد مايكلي ريديوسد سيمتوماتيك سي ار تي دي فيبريليتور If, the, if he has a left bundle, if he has a, if he has not a QRS, ICD. We don't have resources for this yet. I, 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 that's why we prioritize. It has no role. It has no role. No role. No role. Primary prevention wise, it doesn't happen. Too much to write here. I want to know. Oh, of course. I'm sure that there's a gap between the two. You are addressing very. يعني important uh, topic اللي هو prevention و sudden death طبعا thank you very much uh, احمد يعني excellent as usual يعني. هو طبعا uh, ال الداون جريدنج اللي حصل لدايريتي كارديومابثي بقى كلاس 2 اي primary prevention و الحقيقه انا يعني currently uh, بيبقى مطلوب من احنا في الاوروبيان هارت فيلر اسوسيشن ان كل واحد يبقى يكتب كومبوزيشن uh, بيبر ودي بت بت يعني بيشارك فيها اكثر من 25 واحد في يوروب يعني وانا دلوقتي بقالي يمكن اربع شهور على الموضوع ده في اللي هو البريفنشن بعد النيو دراكس واللي هم ليهم رول في السادن ديث فشود وي ستيل كونسيدر اي سي دي كبرايمري بريفنشن دو وي نيد اي سي دي فور افري بيشنت يوزنج الفور دراكس ولا لا ولا زلنا بقى يعني باراء مختلفه عشان يعني ويز وذاوت وبس يعني في الاخر هو انديفيدواليز بعد الست شهور من الفور دراكس يو هاف تو ري ايفالويت البيشنت فور ايجكشن فراكشن اقل من 35 ولسه فوق 35 ايج يونج طبعا هيبقى برايورتي كوموربيديتيز والاكسبكتد سرفايفل With CMR for myocardial fibrosis, and finally, the genetic predisposition. Those are the priorities for implanting sudden death. The ejection fraction is still less than 35. 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 The ejection fraction is still Is CMR the role in selection high risk yes, individuals? Yes, yes, yes. Late gadolinium enhancement for myocardial fibrosis, one of the predictors for sudden death. Then you say you'll go from here. Yes. Okay. But Dr. Magdi, this is a very important input. Thank you so much. Since in the one of the decision makers in terms of the European guidelines, امتى الماركرز اللي حضرتك بتقول عليها دي كلها هتغير فعليا الجايد لاينز؟ يعني ما زلنا بنقرا ان ذيز ار ريسك ماركرز ذات برايورتايز بس ات داز نوت ريموف ذا انديكيشن يعني ايفن اف اتس داون جريدد فروم 1 تو 2 اي 2 اي از ستيل ا جود انف انديكيشن ذات وي ورك اون فحضرتك فور سيينج ان ده ممكن يحصل سون بيزد اون ذا ديسكشنز ذات يو ار هافينج؟ المشكله ان احنا ما عندناش ستاديز لونج تيرم مع النيو دراكس دي اللي هي الاس جي 2 انهبيتور اللي سب اناليزيس من الدب اتش اف والامبرور ريديوز وروا ان هم لهم انتي اريثميك افكت وبيقللوا سادن ديث سيجنيفيكنتلي بس الكومبينيشن بقى بتاع بيتا بلوكر اللي احنا عارفين انها بتقلل السادن ديث ب 30% والام ار اي ام ار اي 26 تقريبا والسالكوبيتريك فال سرتان والاس جي 2 انهبيتور بقى الفور دراكس دول لما يتاخدوا بالماكسيمم دوزز ما عندناش بقى ميتا اناليزيس ولا لونج تيرم ديتا تقول البريفنشن اوف سادن ديث في النون اسكيميك هيخلينا 
يبقى داون جريد مور من 2A ل 2B ده هيبان بقى في الـ يمكن سو ذيس ويل تيك ييرز اه يس يس انما ستيل وي هاف تو فولو الجايد لاينز ديفينتلي اتس كلاس 2A في النون اسكيميك في اللو ريسورس سيت اب كونتريز طبعا وي شود طبعا يعني يوز بقى الجايد لاين دايركت ميديكال ثيرابي ايرلير عشان الايجكشن فراكشن يتحسن ويبقى فوق 35 وما نحتاجش للاي سي دي لان ده طبعا هيبقى كوست افكتيف يعني للدراج ثيرابي الحقيقة in time uh, we are about uh, uh, to finish uh, this uh, lovely scientific meeting. Uh, let me uh, call my uh, colleagues, chairpersons of session four, uh, Dr. Ahmed Adil, Dalia Ramisi, Rada Sayed, Marwa Mashal, Rada Diab, we have the Rish Samah al Afras. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, my dear uh, professor, uh, Dr. Kareem Saeed, who will talk about uh, new target in management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Dr. Kareem. Thank you. طبعا انا سعيد ان انا اكون اخر اخر واحد بيتكلم في اليوم الجميل ده واخد جزء من نجاحه اختم بيه المحاضره بتاعتي ان شاء الله. هو التوبك بتاعنا اللي بنتكلم عليه النهارده يمكن جديد شويه. احنا لما بنعالج عيان عنده هارت فيلير دايما الاوت كم اللي احنا بنفكر فيها دايما السيمتوم تكونش العيان بقى سيمتومز امبروفد ولا لا. المرتالي اتحسنت ولا لا. العيان ما بقتش يدخل المستشفى ولا لا. لكن الحاجات دي صعبه جدا اللي احنا نستناها عشان اعرف انا اتشيف دي ماي تارجت اور نوت. السيمتومز ممكن العيان ما يبقاش سيمبتوماتيك انت ستيل ايليجيبل فور ميديكيشنز هتابعه ازاي؟ الهارت فيلير هوسبيتاليزيشن مش ذا ميجر ايفنت لو حصلت تريك ماي هوبس فور ذا مانجمنت اوف ذيس بيشنت. وبالتالي احنا عندنا انترميديت سيروجيتس ناو تو جادج ويذر اور بيشنتس ار جوينج ان ذا رايت دايركشنز اور نوت. اللي هو الكاردياك ريموديلنج. وات از كاردياك ريموديلنج؟ كلمه كاردياك ريموديلنج دخلت الكارديولوجي في الثمانينات 1983 لما كانوا بيوصفوا التشينج اللي بيحصل في الانفاركتد مايوكارديوم الاريا اللي حصل فيها انفاركت سموها ريموديلد اريا. في التسعينات يوجين كرونولد ومارك بيفر انتروديوس ذا تيرم كاردياك ريموديلنج ويز سام سبيسيفيك سبيسيفيكيشنز. to describe the infarcted and non-infarcted uh, myocardium in the heart. And since then, it is one of the components in the heart failure uh, science. What is cardiac remodeling in terms of uh, scientific uh, perspectives? It is a multi-dimensional term. It is a change in the structure of the heart. So we're going to talk about dimensions, we're going to talk about mass. It is a change in the function. So when you talk about systolic function, diastolic function, or valvular function. It's a change in the shape. The heart the global specific shape. Then maybe change the shape without this is remodeled myocardium. We have other dimensions for remodeling in our uh, thinking. It is change in the myocytes. The dry shape beta. It is remodeled myocytes. Change in the interstitium. Interstitium will be a second. We remodeled. So thinning or thickening, it is remodeled. Change in the sub, uh, cellular compartment. The heart failure will lay the cells, the mitochondria, the density, the structure will change. The endoplasmic reticulum will change. The cell receptor population the density of it will change. It is remodeled. So the word remodeling is entered. We have vascular remodeling in coronary hypertension. We have plaque remodeling in coronary artery sclerosis. We have electrical remodeling. Lateral fibrillation. So it is now a well recognized term in the field of cardiology. The remodeling is an integral part in the journey of heart failure. A injury through multiple mechanisms with hypertrophy, fibrosis, apoptosis, necrosis, 
uh, abnormal energy production and ventricular function this function dilation ده في الاخر بيؤدي الى remodeling وفي الاخر بيؤدي الى heart failure الجيرني دي نقدر نقسمها الى compensatory او good remodeling and bad remodeling the good remodeling ان الهايبرتروفي ده is beneficial لانه بيقلل الاسترس على الهارت الفايبروز از ذا سيم لانه بيمنع الدايليشن اوف ذا هارت الفينتريكال دايليشن از جود لانه بيحسن الكارديك اوت بوت الانرجي برودكشن ريموديلنج از جود ان الهارت يوجوالي في الهارت فيلير بيتحول بيشفت من الجلوكوز ميتابوليزم فاتي اسيد ميتابوليزم وده كويس لانه هي هيدي انرجي اكتر بيدي انرجي اكتر من الجلوكوز لكن ات ستيب هنلاقي ان الريموديلنج ده بقى بال ما كان ما هو ادابتيف بقى مال ادابتيف الهايبرتروفي بي The imbalance in my parallel oxygen demand supply, the fibrosis, the nidus for arrhythmia, the energy production, the fat is good, but it takes oxygen a lot, so it adds to the burden of ischemia in the heart. The ventricular dilation in the end is futile, and the cardiac output is ill. And in the end, we reach the three bad outcomes for heart failure in terms of symptoms, hospitalizations, or mortality. نقدر نفكر في ريموديلنج ان تو دايركشنز المال ادابتيف ريموديلنج اللي اتكلمنا عليه uh, يؤدي الى الهارت فيلير اند ذا بيشنت ويل داي لكن عندنا دلوقتي اوبورتونيتي تو ريفيرس ذيس ريموديلنج اند ناو وي هاف ذا تيرم اوف ريفيرس ريموديلنج ده ممكن يبقى اتشيف بالميديكيشنز كل الفيلرز بتاعت الهارت فيلير بروف ان هي بتريفيرس ريموديلنج الديفايسز السي ار تي الالفاد كل ده بيريفيرس الموديلنج اند ان سام بيشنتس وي مي اتشيف Uh, back to the normal. How to assess left ventricular remodeling? زي ما احنا شايفين احنا بنتكلم على multi dimensional task. It is very difficult to assess it by single target. Uh, هو ال imaging وال biomarkers. نقدر نأسس remodeling. وال imaging ال echo وال CMR. وال most common هو ال echo. To assess the systolic function, the most commonly used surrogate is ejection fraction. بس احنا عارفين ejection fraction ليه limitations كتيرة جدا. هو derived equations بنعمل equations. Load dependent, where actually it is not uh, reproduced. ما فيش حد بيطلع ejection fraction زي التاني even in the same patient even in the same time. The more accurate هو left ventricular systolic volume. It is not a derived equation. من ما فيش معادلة هذا بنقيسه. It is less load dependent. The studies بينت إنه هو more accurate عن ejection fraction. بالذات لما ejection fraction يكون واطي. عشان كده دلوقتي بنبص في guidelines لما نتكلم على valvular indications for surgery بنلاقي the systolic volume with dimensions, دائما مع الإجاكشن فراكشن في الأورتك رجاج وفي المايتا رجاج. فـ Insocelic volume and dimension should be one of our uh, novel indices to adopt. Um, المورفولوجي uh, بس not commonly used. المايتا رجاج even mild مايتا رجاج is associated with poor prognosis. Uh, and E over A prime ratio as a marker for a load اوفر ذا ليفت فينتريكال. احنا ليه مهتمين بالريموديلنج؟ لاسباب كتيره، اول حاجه ان هو از ا ماركر تو اسس الريسبونس تو ذا سيرفي زي ما قلنا، مش هستنى لغايه ما نشوف كلينيكال ايفنت. والمثال اللي ده السي ار تي ريسبونسر، الديفينيشن بتاع السي ار تي ريسبونسر هو ان الانسوستريك فوليوم يقل اكثر من 15% والاجكشن فراكشن يزيد اكثر من 5%، ده الديفينيشن، ات از ا ريموديل بيست ديفينيشن. الريسك ستراتيفيكيشنز. لو شفنا البريدكتورز بتاعه الريموديلنج مين اللي حصل لهم ريفيرس ريموديلنج الفيميل اللايكلود اكتر ان هم حصل لهم ريفيرس ريموديلنج الاسكيميك ايتيولوجي لان هم عندهم النان اسكيميك ايتيولوجي لان عندهم تشانس ان ابسنس اوف فايبروزيس ريليتد تو ذا اسكيميا ان الهارت فيلير يبقى في شورت ديوريشن اللايكلود اوف ريفيرس ريموديلنج از هاي الاجكشن فراكشن هنا ده ماركر في ريموديلنج كل ما الاجكشن فراكشن كان واطي كل ما اللايكلود ان العاني يتحسن ان ترم اوف ابسوليوت تشينج اكتر لو عيان ببتدي ايجكشن فراكشن 40 صعب اوصل ل 45 50 لكن لما ببتدي ب 20 عيانين كتير جدا بيوصلوا لل 30 والمور ذان 30 والبايو ماركرز فهو ات از ا جود تول فور ريسك ستراتيفيكيشنز ات از ا جود بوينت فور ريسيرش احنا عشان نبروف ان في دراج از جود بنحتاج عدد كبير جدا من العيانين نفولو فور ا فيري لونج بيريود اوف تايم وبنحتاج عدد كبير من الايفنتس لكن دلوقتي بالسي ام ار ممكن اتارجت سام انديسز زي الايجكشن فراكشن او الفوليومز في عدد قليل من العيانين ما يحتاجش لونج تيرم فولو اب وابين ان الدواء ده كويس وان كان ده ليبيد فور 
ان لازم يبقى اسوشيتد بايفيدنس فور كلينيكال امبروفمنت عندنا ستادي قديمه جدا اسمها الارث ستادي كانوا بيشوفوا الانتي تيومر نيكروزيس فاكتور في العين اللي عندهم هارت فيلير حسنت الانديسز والمورتاليتي زادت فهو dimensions او ريموديل ريليتد انديسز بلس كلينيكال اند بوينتس الريموديلنج ستادي از جود تو اسيس الميكانيزم والميكانيستيك باثواي فور ذا ديفلوبمنت اوف هارت فيلير وتبقى تارجت فور انترفنشن واضح جدا لما نتكلم على الهيف ريف والهيف بيف ان تيرم اوف ريموديلنج ان احنا عندنا تو ديفرنت ديزيز الهيف ريف بيبقى فوليوم اوفرلود اسوشيتد ويز اكسنتريك ريموديلنج والفوليوم الليفت بتاعك فوليوم بتبقى انلارج البروجكشن فراكشن از ريديوسد العكس تماما في الهيف بيف it is eccentric concentric remodeling normal volume normal ejection fraction what is the relationship between cardiac remodeling and the prognosis in heart failure هل لما بدرس index ده لي impact على الاوتكم and the answer is yes in the sharm trial the reduction of ejection fraction by 10% below 45% the baseline is associated with 45% increase in the composite outcome of cardiovascular disc and heart failure hospitalization. Or more than 50% increase in cardiovascular disc. That's mm -hmm. the most important ejection fraction. And if we add 45, the ejection fraction will not have any input on cardiovascular risk. Same thing, uh, reproduce, and we talk about volume. For each mil, 10 mil increase in endosolic volume, there is a 10 percent increase in the composite of this and the heart failure hospitalization. And for every 10 mil increase in systolic volume, we have corresponding 15% increase in such composite. More impressive, the line of CRT, a responder, more than the systolic volume, more than 15%, without the ejection fraction, 5%, the mortality, mortality, more than the camp, 68%. And the same was related to the endostolic volume, but not with the same power of the endostolic volume. Okay, so we understood that the remodeling is a good surrogate, and that it can be translated into a good clinical outcome. The third question, what is the role of recent guidelines directed medical therapy in cardiac remodeling? Who is the best agent in them? وهل اللي بيحسن الاجكشن فراكشن زي اللي بيحسن الانسستوليك فوليوم زي اللي بيحسن الاندستوليك فوليوم. This is a very good uh, table. We summarize all the data we have قبل ظهور ال SGLT2 inhibitor وال RNA. بيقول مين أحسن؟ لو بصينا على الاجكشن فراكشن مين أحسن موداليتي؟ ال CRT. السهم هنا ظاهر؟ السهم ظاهر ولا؟ ظاهر. ال CRT بيحسن الاجكشن فراكشن باي 40%. Relative increase in the ejection fraction by 40%. The RASP blocker, and here the RASP blocker, we're talking about the ACI and ARPS. It has been measured at 14%, the same as the beta blocker. The beta blocker and the RASP blocker, apart from the ARNI, the same as the other in the study. Okay, so we have the ACI and ARPS. We have the ACI and the 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 طيب لو بصينا على الانسستوليك فوليوم مين احسن حد؟ برضه السي ار تي بيحسن او بيقلل الانسستوليك فوليوم باي 32% متوقع وبما ان الانسستوليك فوليوم هو الميرور بتاع الايجكشن فراكشن فهلاقي نفس الارقام الايكويفلنت بين الراس بلوكر والبيتا بلوكر اللي هي حوالي 12% و 11% والام ار اي برضه اقلهم 4% طب الدايليشنز برضه السي ار تي اهم واحد 21% ريدكشن في الفوليوم لكن الراس الاي سي اي والاربس مور باورفول عن البيتا بلوكر ان هم يقللوا الفوليوم بنتكلم على 10% فيرسس 5% دبل وده برضه بنشوفه يعني اللي بياخدوا اي سي اي وسمول دوز اوف بيتا بلوكر بيجيت بينفيت ان تيرم اوف ريدكشن في الاندستري والام ار اي 2.2% فاحنا عندنا فيري جود ايفيدنس ان الدراجز والايفيدنس بيست ريكومند ميديكيشنز بتريفيرس ريموديلنج الموست باورفول از السي ار تي ديفينتلي راس بلوكيت ابارت من الارني في التيبل ده جود سبيسيفيكلي فور الدايليشنز البيتا بلوكر جود سبيسيفيكلي فور الايجكشن فراكشن الام ار اي مودست طيب ايه الداتا اللي بتسبورت او البيهايند الارني دو هاف داتا السكوبيتريال بالسرتان 
هل دي تيتا ان هو بينيفيشال ان تيرم اوف ريفرسال موديلنج اند ذا انسر از يس وي هاف ميني ترايلز ذات كومبيرد العينين اللي كانوا ماشيين على الاي سي اي وبعدين اتحولوا لارمي وقارنوهم بالعينين اللي كملوا على الاي سي اي بس قبل ما نقول الريزالتس بنبص على البروفايل اوف ذوس بيشنتس احنا بنتكلم على عيانين الديوريشن اوف فولو اب بتاعهم كان نوت لونج بين 3 تو 12 مانس وبنتكلم على عيانين كانوا واخدين الايفيدنس بيسد ثيرابي واخدين الجود دوز اوف بيتا بلوكر والجود دوز اوف ام ار اي اند اب تو 40% كانوا هاد هافينج السي ار تي والسي ار تي دي فهم عشان اخد بينيفيت ات شود بي ريال تشالنج The findings among these studies in the army compared to the SCI associated with 5% absolute increase in ejection fraction. Will benefit that be said? Maybe it will reach 10%. We're going to talk about longer duration, one year. But the average 5%. This is the same number we saw with the SCI and RAS. But this is additive. It took the SCI to get the 5% and then other 5% within a year. Absolute increase in ejection fraction. نفس ال findings من اللي يعلم نتكلم على end historic dimensions سواء volume or سواء diastolic or systolic dimensions. The slide there is very interesting. لأن ده بي بيبين the temporal changes اللي هتحصل في the change في the ejection fraction and end historic volume بعد ما بي introduce the SCI versus the army. على ايدنا الشمال لو احنا عيان ابتدى ب اي سي اي في تايم زيرو وتابعته لمده تسع شهور المتوقع ان الايجكشن فراكشن بيتحسن في اول ثلاث شهور بيوصل الرابد سيجنيفيكانت انكريز وزين 3 مانث زين وي هاف ا بلاتو هير لو انا هنا وقفت الاي سي اي ورحت حاطط اون توب الارني بنبتدي نلاحظ ان في سم تشينجز بتحصل عند الشهر الثالث اللي هو من اليوم الشهر التاسع لل 12 ويبقى سيجنيفيكانت عند الشهر السادس من بدايه الارني ويكمل لغايه نهايه السنه. ففي هنا تيمبرال ديسوشيشن واحد بيبتدي بعد ثلاث شهور واحد بيبتدي بعد ثلاث شهور ويكمل وزاوت بلاتو. ونفس التشينج دي ميرورد لما بنتكلم على اند ديستوريك دايمنشنز برضو الاي سي اي بيحقق ريدكشن في اول ثلاث شهور وبعدين بلاتو لو انا وقفت وابتديت الارني هيبتدي اشوف سيجنيفيكانت ريدكشن بعد ثلاث شهور يكمل عن 6 مانس اند ويز كونتينيو. ان تيرم اوف مايتر ريجيرج لما قلنا المايتر ريجيرج ايفن اف از مايلد از اسوشيتد ويز ويرس اوت كم. انتروداكشن اوف ارني سايكوبيتيرفال سارتان ان بيشنس ويز هارت فيلير از اسوشيتد ويز سيجنيفيكانت ريدكشن بنتكلم على ديجريدز 1.6 هينزل ل 1. That we reflect the changes in the geometry, changes in the contractility, and the changes in the dimensions. So, those three dominators for the production of mitral regurgitation. We go to the mitral regurgitation. It's important because the symptoms, important because the atrial fibrillation, important because the mortality. The reduction of mitral regurgitation may be indirect or even direct mediator for such improvement. وبالتالي in short to summarize the impact of sacrobiotic varsartan versus ACI in those patients treated for short period of time on top of good medical treatment, it increased the ejection fraction absolute with five percent, and it reduced all indices of volume and the dimensions, and it decreased the left atrial volume as well. لما انا شفت الليفت اترال فوليوم قلت ده هيبقى ريفلكتد على الاترال فايبريليشن اكشولي ارني هاز نو رول اون ذا انسيدنت اوف اترال فايبريليشن كومبيرد ويز الاي سي اي والاربس لان هول جوب واز دان باي ذا بريزنس اوف بالسرتان ان ذوس بيشنتس لكن يو دونت هاف ايفيدنس ان هو بيبريفنت الانسيدنت اور نيو اترال فايبريليشن وان كان بيبريفنت الانسيدنت فينتريكولار فايبريليشن Finally, we have uh, an important trial that link uh, remodeling with ARMI, a layer proof heart failure trial. They published two years ago. AID is the only dedicated study till now to address such link. For our surprise, we don't have a definitive clue how ARMI improve 
ذا اوت كم احنا عارفين ان هو بيقلل الان تي برو ام بي ازاي بقى الان تي برو ام بي اللي نزل ده ترانسليتد انتو جود كلينيكال اوت كم وي دو نوت هاف اني ايفيدنس ات مي بي ميديتد ثرو ريموديلنج ده كان الايم اوف ساتش ستادي الاستادي دي جمعت 800 عيان وتابعوهم على مدار سنه وكانوا على ديفرنت دوزج اوف ارني وشافوا مالتيبل انديسز اوف ريموديلنج وعملوا لها كوريليشن بالبايو ماركرز اللي احنا قلنا البايو ماركر انذر دايمنشنز فور ستادينج ريموديلنج لو بس هنا لو بصينا على البروفايل اوف بيشنتس هنلاقيهم ان هم بيرفلكت الهيف ريف بوبوليشنز اللي هم 60 بلس يير اولد المين ايج 70% ميل uh, 95% كانوا بياخدوا بيتا بلوكر ها ثيرد اوف سبيشن كانوا على ام ار اي ده اكتر من البرسنت اللي موجود في البارادايم اكشولي الاستادي دي مختلفه عن البارادايم ان سيفرال بوينتس البارادايم كانت بتاخد العيانين بعد ما يوفوا فيز اسمها ران ران اوف ران اون فيز العيان لازم يثبت ان هو بيستحمل التارجت تريتمنت دوز ومن غير سايد افكتس فيري سيلكتد لا هنا اي عيان ده ريال لايف العيان اللي هيجي بديله الارني رقم اثنين البارادايم كان بتتطلب في الانكلوجن كرايتيريا بتاعتها ليفل uh, محدد من الانتي برو ام بي هنا لا ما زي ما احنا بنعمل ما بناخدش عيانين عندهم برو ام بي البارادايم كان بتطلب عيانين عندهم كرونيك هارت فيلير هنا لا كرونيك اند دونوفو هنا 15% من العيانين كان عندهم دونوفو هارت فيلير فهي ديفرنت عن البارادايم الريزلتس الايجكشن فراكشن في خلال السنه اتحسن بمقدار 10% ابسوليوت انكريس في الايجكشن فراكشن 10% ده ان انذر ثينكينج 25% اوف بيشنتس الايجكشن فراكشن بتاعهم اتحسن اكتر من 13% يعني اللي بادي 20 بقى 33 واللي بادي 30 بقى 43 كان في دايما سؤال طيب هل لما بستخدم الارني والعيان على ايجكشن فراكشن واطي فرصه ان يخليني اعدي الثريشولد فور امبلانتيشن بتاع السي ار تي والاي اي سي دي عاليه ولا واطيه؟ الكويستشن اللي كان احمد بيحاول يجاوب عليه المحاضره اللي فاتت هنلاقي ان ان ذيس بوبيوليشن بعد ست شهور من بدايه الارني تلت العيانين عدوا الثريشولد بتاع ال 35% وبقوا نو مور اليجيبل فور الاي اي سي دي او السي ار تي طب بعد السنه تو ثيرتس فهي مش بس ان هي بتحسن الايجكشن فراكشن ان تيرم اوف اوت كم اور بروجنوزز لكن حتى الديفرنت موداليتي اوف تريتمنت اللي هي الكوستلي والكامبرسن ريديوسد ميرورد مع الامبروفمنت في الايجكشن فراكشن الاند ذا سوليك فوليوم والانسيستوليك فوليوم قال له اكسبكتد الليفت اتريال فوليوم اندكس قال از ويل والاي اوفر اي برايم ريشيو قلت اكشولي ما عندناش داتا من ستاديز كبيره ان سيميلر دراجز كان برودوس ساتش تشينج في الاي اوفر اي برايم ريشيوز وديكريس في الليفت اتريال فيلينج بريشر ذيس واز نوت كونسيستنتلي برودوسد ويز اي سي اي اند اربس ليتريتشر ده سلايد مهم لان هو بيبين ال NT برو ام بي نزل ازاي في الاستادي دي اللي هي مده سنه هو هنا بري بريديوس الفايندنجز اللي اتلقت في البارادايم ان ال NT برو ام بي نزل بسرعه في اول اسبوعين وبقى سيجنيفيكانت لغايه اخر شهر وبعد كده بقى بلاتو ايه المسج اللي ناخدها من ال ال الكيرف ده ان الماجوريتي اوف بينيفيت بتحصل ايرلي يبقى انا مهم ابتدي التريتمنت ده ايرلي لان البيرفت مش محتاجه مني ييرز اهم من كده او سيميلر ليها على عكس البارادايم ان احنا هنا كنا بندي اي دوز البينفيت دي اتحققت مع اي دوز اديناها من الارني 50 100 200 وبالتالي ات ووز دوز اندبندنت وده اللي بنعمله في ريال لايف ساعات بنلاقي نفسينا ستاكد على ال 50 Does this mean we have uh, impact on the outcome from this curve? Yes, it occurs early, significantly, 
independently from the those of the army. These changes in the indices, so we're going to talk about functional or dimensional indices, was significantly correlated with changes in the biomarkers. This is the one in NT-ProMB. The reduction of the NT-ProMB was tightly significantly correlated with uh, favorable change in the indices. As I said, the trials they can it مختلف عن البارادايم in three groups. اللي هما دونوفو, اللي هما without NT-ProMB. اللي هم without dose titration. فالquestion هل ال value and the positive impact of such trial was uh, uh, replicated in those three different populations? The answer is yes. It works whether it is a chronic or de novo heart failure, whether we ask it for or we did not ask for NT pro MP level, and whether we have reached or did not reach the target dose. So in conclusion, cardiac remodeling is important and it refers to change in different morphological uh, issues in the heart. However, it needs multimodality assessment in terms of imaging and the biomarker. And it is associated with worse outcome in patients with ZFRF. And all known GE guideline directed medical therapy improve different indices of cardiac remodeling with variable degrees, and ARNI significantly improved cardiac remodeling in heart failure versus ACI or on after being on ACI or ARPS, even with lower than the target dose. And in this trial, this extends to different population. And before ending uh, this presentation, uh, I just knew that we access or near access في the heart failure clinic دلوقتي اللي احنا نبريسكرايب الارني دايركتلي على نفقه الدوله. And it will be a, a easy direct process ان شاء الله. Uh, this will be the way to provide service to our patients and to do research uh, among those patients ان شاء الله. Uh, شكرا لحضراتكم. Uh, thank you very much دكتور كريم. Uh, حد عنده اي اسئله؟ طبعا عندي سؤال الكاردك ريموديلنج واتس اتس كوريليشن ويز سيمتومز احنا عارفين ايجكشن فراكشن كان دايما ما فيش اي كوريليشن خالص مع السيمتومز والسيمتومز هي اللي بتفرق مع العيان في التريتمنت اللي احنا بنديه بعد كده فهل الكاردك ريموديلنج هيدينا يعني ريفلكشن على السيمتومز بتاعت العيان امبروفمنت او ديتيريشن ولا مالهاش علاقه هل هتبقى ده هو اللي هيقوم كامل الايجكشن فراكشن بعد كده في الترايلز از ا بيتر marker uh, for assessment يعني احسن من ejection fraction ولا ايه رايك؟ اوكي هنبتدي الاول بالبوزيشن اوف سيمتومز ان ذا ساينس اوف هارت فيلير السيمتومز مهمه ككواليتي اوف لايف لكن للاسف الرول بتاعها في از ا بريدكتور فور ذا اوت كم از نوت هاي زي بقيه الانديسيز بوينت البوينت الثانيه للاسف لغايه دلوقتي احنا السيمتومز بتعتمد على كويستشنير نيها 1 حتى لغايه دلوقتي كلمه نيها 1 فيرسس نيها 2 از نوت ويل كاركترايزد وفي ستاديز قديمه بتبين ان الكونكوردنس بين النيها اسسمنت امونج بيشنتس ويز هارت فيلير از نوت جود مره هيقول لي فانكشن كلاس 2 ومره هيقول لي فانكشن كلاس 1 ومره هيقول فانكشن كلاس 3 فرغم اللي احنا عندنا ذيس ادفانسز في الايمجنج والبايو ماركر تيل ناو وي دو نوت هاف جود ايفيدنس تو اسيس سيمتومز وده يفسر ليه ان احنا لغايه دلوقتي ما عندناش جود كوريليشن بين الايجكشن فراكشن اند سيمتومز كلنا عندنا الاكسبيرينس ان في عيان عنده ايجكشن فراكشن فيري لو والسيمتومز ذيس اسيمتوماتيك والعكس الهف بيف جود ايجكشن فراكشن اند وور سيمتوم فده يرفلكت ليه لغايه دلوقتي احنا ما عندناش امباكت واضح ما بين الامبروفمنت او التشنجز في الريموديلنج انديسز والتشنج في الايجكشن فراكشن ولا في السيمبس. ثانك يو كريم از يوجوال. كريم اوبتمايزيشن اوف ميديكال تريتمنت الكلمه دي صعبه شويه. هل لازم اوصل لساكوبيتريل بالزاكتان لريكومندد دوز؟ احنا ان ريال لايف ساعات كتيره ما بنوصلش. هل انا قصرت في حق العيان بتاعي؟ لا لازم 
اضغط عليه عشان اعمل كده تو اتشيف الريموديلنج المطلوب في الاستدي اللي انت عرضتها جابوا نتائج كويسه ان سب اوبتيم دوز رايك ايه؟ ده فيري جود براكتيكال كويستشنز بنساله نفسينا كل ما نشوف عيان عنده هارت فيلير وابتدينا له الارني وعلى 50 ونفسي اروح لل 100 وعايز اكمل ال 200 لكن البلاد بريشر بتاعي مش سامح لي او العيان ابتدى يسيمتوماتايز الانسر جاي من البارادايم اند ان اذر فروم اذر ترايلز البارادايم طبعا كان بتطلب ان العيان يدخل بتارجت بجود على التارجت دوز لكن الديسكونتينيويشن ريت والريت اوف لوورنج اوف الارني دوز وذين الانفايرمنت الفيري ويل كنترول ذا انفايرمنت اوف ذا بارادايم واز سيجنيفيكت 20% 30% سمثينج لايك ذس اند ديسبايت اوف ذس زي اتشيفد ذير جود اوت دي بوينت البوينت الثانيه ان سب جروب اناليسيز من الترايلز والبارادايم لا اللور دوز كان اسوشيتد ويز good outcome uh, among those individuals. Actually, we have some evidence like a mish will characterized and those may differ according to the gender even. In the females versus male, those few women can be different. Next concept that we can talk about the GTMT, the beta blocker, the ACI, to give the maximum tolerable uh, dose. Uh, thank you, Karim. Excellent presentation, Helen. Uh, we were doing a study on the secretary of the first Egyptian experience on the message of Muhammad al-Nims. We observed that the dose of 50 mg has the symptoms of quality of life. But the increase in ejection fraction can be significant with the dose of 100 to 200. So, we have to encourage ان احنا نوصل للماكسيمم توليريت دوز فهل ده في الليتريتشر ان دوز ريليتد الانكريس ريجكتيف راكشن احنا شفنا فيري انترستنج سلايد بيوري ان 30% من العيانين كانوا اقل من 35 او اباب 35 فده بقى يعني كوريليتد مع الدوز لو احنا ترانسليتد الاندر دوز في البارادايم ترايلز اند اذر ترايل از بينج ذا ماكسيمم توليرابل دوز ذا انسر از يس انا مش هيبقى عندي عيان يقدر ياخد 100 وانا موقفه عند ال 50 واتوقع امبروفمنت لكن اف ذيس 50 اور ايفن 100 ايكوال ماكسيمم توليرابل دوز اباف ويتش ذا بيشنت ويل هاف سايد افكتس سو ذا انسر از يس ذيس ويل بي اسوشيتد ويز بيتر اوت كم هاويفر We have also good evidence in the 50 dose, 50 milligram dose is associated with good uh, outcome in addition to the symptoms. Karim, has a question and Dr. Magdi. The question was for you, but we will answer it in the question and answer. We have four of the people who are using them in heart failure. And then all the guidelines encourage us to use the big four pillars, the beta blockers, the mineral receptor antagonist, the sacrobitrail valsartel ACE arbs, and the sodium glucose co-transporter two inhibitors. When we use the four of them, we may extend survival by 8.3 years. في العينين اللي عندهم هارت فيلر يدوس ايجيكشن فراكشن. نديهم ازاي؟ سيكونس اوف ديسكرايبنج الاربعه الكبار. هندي الاربعه سمول دوز ونزود ولا هندي سيكوينشال ولا هنعمل ايه؟ اسمع اجابتك نختم بيها واجابه الدكتور مجدي واشوف رايكم. <تصفيق> نعمل اللي فيها اوكي طب يا ريت يا ريت نسمع كريم طيب انا هي بس انا عايز كومنت صغير على السيكونس السيكونس ده نوت تيستد ان ترايلز ده تيستد ان مودلز موديلنج فما عندناش لغايه دلوقتي ايفيدنس ان السيكونس ده ديفر من الاذرز لان احنا عندنا كذا سكول تو تيلر السيرابي دي نوت النقطة الثانية 
واحب اسمع راي دكتور مجدي فيها فور ييرز ماني ييرز ات ووز بروباجيتد ذات اتشيف ذا تارجت دوز بيفور انذر وان احنا لو وصلنا للهاف دوز ده مش حلو وده في الهايبر تنشن وده في الديسلايبيديميا وده في دلوقتي بقى في بارادايم شيء ما انا عايز راي حضرتك انا بقول لا انا مش لا انا مش قاصد واحد وبعدين شيفت مش قاصد كده انا قاصد يعني if you can go for a higher dose go لان الهاير دوز از بيتر ذان ذا سب ماكسيمم وان لكن لكن الكونسبت دلوقتي ان احنا تو هاف ا مودست تو ستارت ويز ا مودست دوز ويز اول فور بيلرز اند ذيس ويل بي بيتر ذان ميبي ما نعرفش Uh, having a full dose from uh, other list number of medications. أنا ما بقولش أنا ما بقولش conclusion عايز أخد رأي دكتور مجدي فيها. دكتور أو فين نسمع رأيك؟ طبعاً أنا 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 بش تمام to act upon the different mechanisms. يعني لا مش هقدر اخش بالاس بس وانا شغاله الانجيو ريسبتور دوكر سيستم طب وات اباوت ذا سيمباثيك سيستم وات اباوت ذا نيورو هرمون وات اباوت ذا فوليومز انا لازم اخش بالاربعه فيلرز عشان دول موستلي الاربعه كومن ميكانيزمز ار اكتنج في الهارت فيلر خواجه بقى بيقول طبعا خواجه بقى بيقول ان دايما ده هو السؤال اللي فيري كومنلي يعني اسكت في الميتنجز وتش دراك تو ستارت ويف وطبعا دكتور كريم طبعا يعني انا ابريشيتنج هيز انسر طبعا لان هو يعني بيزد اون راشنال بس طبعا ديفنتلي الكومبينيشن ثيرابي أنا كنت بس مجهز كام سلايد كده على إن الحضرة لأن أنا كنت برضو أتوقع مفاجآت كنت خايف لأن هو إز فيري بيزي أوكي سو البيشنت بروفايل طبعا بعد ما كلنا عرفنا الجايد لاينز الجديدة والنيو إنديكيشن بلس 1 إيه للدابا والإمبا وده سلايد بيسامرايز طبعا ال Decrease the risk of sudden death في different groups 30% وده طبعا discussed very nicely with Dr. Emmanuel and Dr. Ahmed وطبعا Dr. Kareem في the paradigm significant reduction في the risk of sudden death ولذلك احنا بنقول اللي احنا عايزين ندي the four pillars as earlier as possible عشان ن prevent sudden death وده the slide the very common خلاص بقى the four pillars وده يعني الدسكشن بقى الثري فاندمنتال تشينجز في الابروتش في النيو جايد لاينز اللي هو الاوردر والسيكونس اوف ثيرابي طبعا ما فيش فيكسد اوردر وما فيش بريفرنس للسيكونس يوز ده كان اول اقتراح وبعد كده الانيشيشن فيرسس الدوز تايتريشن هل البريورتي هنا للانيشيشن على الاب تايتريشن اللي هو النقطه اللي كان بيشرحها دلوقتي الدكتور كريم انك تبتدي وبعدين توصل للماكسيمم دوز وبعد كده تحط دراج تاني و و و والسبيد بقى يعني الكلام ده يبقى اوفر ويكس ولا اوفر مانث ولا اوفر يير فدول كلهم الاسئله اللي بتسال الاس جي تو انهيبيتور ده بقى يعني وزاوت ثينج يعني هو سنجل دوز نو تايتريشن كان بي ستارتد ان هوسبيتال في الكوميونتي البينيفيت ايرلير ويزن 28 دايز Outstanding tolerability, fish effect on blood pressure, from which are even many men hypotension. We preserve renal function. That one of the hard failure drugs, and the whole of renal protective effect. And come in, just like that. But the hypercaremia, which is common with the use of MRA, when you give SG2 inhibitor, after that, when you give MRA, it reduces the risk of MRA induced hypercaremia. وادي السلايد الشهير اللي طبعا كان بيقصده الدكتور كريم وده كان سجستد بميلتون باكر ده واحد من البايونيرز في الفيلد اوف هارت فيلير وورلد وايد ان كومبيرد بالكونفنشنال سيكونسنج اللي الدكتور كريم قاله 
انك تبتدي بايس وبعدين تايتريت وبعدين تحط بيتا بلوكر ام ار اي او اي ار بي او سايكوبيتريت فالفرتان وبعدين في الاخر اس جي ال 2 انهبيتور ده الكونفنشنال ابروتش زمان وده كان تيكس اب تو 6 مانس طبعا ده بقى بي اكسبوز البيشنت للريسك اوف هوسبيتاليزيشن مورتاليتي صادن ديث فده الابروتش ده خلاص ال يعني وي هاف تو فولو الرابيد سيكونس ايفن سمول دوزز فروم ايتش دراج دي ار ديزيز موديفاينج ايجنتس كومبليمنتري ديفرنت ميكانيزمز اكشن وبالتالي اف وي جيف يعني في الـ في الـ في الديلي براكتس اول حاجه تو اسس الفوليوم ستاتس اوف ذا بيشن دي از كونجستد سو هي شود ريسيف دايوريتكس اند بوست فوم بيتا بلوكر But you can start as GL2 inhibitors, and if the blood pressure is good, you can add at the same time uh, uh, sacrobitril valsartan arni or ACE inhibitor. And then when the patient is decongested, you will add beta blocker, and finally you will add MRA if the serum potassium is normal. Okay? If the patient is decongested dry, I can start from day one beta blocker as GL2 inhibitor It's very safely. And then two weeks, I can add sacrobitril valsartan or ACE inhibitor. And after two weeks, add MRA. The started doses is not the target doses. And after first four weeks with the four drugs, I will start to titrate the drugs based on heart rate, blood pressure, serum creatinine GFR, and serum potassium. Okay. So this is the accepted approach for the rabbit sequence. Uh, and uh, this is the patient profile in heart failure. The position paper based on to individualize treatment guided by the heart rate, the blood pressure, the kidney function, the serum potassium, patient in sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation. So individualization is very important. And if you look for this slide, different uh, patient profiles, according to bradycardia, hypotension, atrial fibrillation, serum potassium, you can see that uh, DABA or IMBA uh, is the first drug which is can, because it has no effect on blood pressure. It has no effect on serum potassium. As long as the GFR is, up to 20 with IMBA and up to 30 with DABA, I can give it safely. So uh, uh, we have to, uh, to treat the patient according to the profile and according to these uh, recommendations. The Egyptian expert opinion recently on the SG2 inhibitors for the HFREF patients. It is a, a collaboration between يعني, Uh, different institutions and experts. Yani Haya Katabu document very high quality or is it a tool yani accepted immediately once you know about uh, Thank you very much. Yani uh, Makula in one fits all let on Tabakalit. We have to tailor uh, treatment, we have to individualize the approach plan. حقيقة في نهاية اليوم العلمي الجميل لا يسعني إلا أنا أشكر الأخ العزيز الأستاذ الدكتور مجدي عبد الحميد. دكتور مجدي هو رئيس اليوم وهو عمل مجهود كبير جدا وجاب لنا ناس من الضيوف الأجانب استمتعنا بالمناقشة استمتعنا بنوعية المحاضرات يا مجدي جميلة قوي وإحنا الحقيقة بنتطلع إلى أيام متتالية من الهارت فيلير. شكرا جزيلا. طبعا بشكر طبعا استاذ الدكتور محمد عبد الغني الحقيقه على يعني اولا هو وافق على اليوم كان تحديد اليوم كان وقت قليل و سبورت طبعا ده اللي هو الحقيقه اللي على طول بنشوفه من الدكتور محمد ولكل الانشطه العلميه بشكر طبعا كل الاساتذه طبعا دكتور وفاء النهارده منورانا دكتور محمد رامي دكتور سامي دكتور عزه ودكتور كريم انا عوضك كل السبيكرز الحقيقه كانت محاضرات رائعه والحضور مميز ويوم ممتاز وده بروفه بقى الايام كتيرة آه يعني في ان شاء الله ديستنجش جروب اوف يعني جيست فاكالتي ذي ار ريدي تو بارتيسيبيت من ديفرنت كانتريز في يوروب ان شاء الله 
ها؟ اه جزبر جزبر زي ديفرنت شكرا يا جماعه احنا عندنا الاسبوع الجاي الانترفينشن انت هتقفل العياده الاسبوع الشهر ده كله لا الاسبوع رمضان في عندنا برضه في العياده الاسبوع الجاي الانترفينشن اللي بعديه السبورت كارديولوجي اللي بعديه الكروس توك الدكتور محمد الرمز الشهر كله تقفل العياده